of the St. Helena City Council in regular session for April 14th, 2015. Uh, the City Council met in closed session for uh, a little over an hour beginning at four o'clock. Um, yes, it is. Testing. I think we're not, we're not live. Do you hear it? Yeah. All right, let me. Uh, any event. Uh, 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 let me begin uh, with the uh, city attorney. Uh, uh, did we have any reportable actions? And if so, would you report them? The city council did meet during this afternoon's uh, four o'clock session to discuss those items designated on today's agenda as item uh, two A, B, C, and D. Um, there were two reportable actions taken with respect to items uh, 2B, the two potential cases of initiation of litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D4. Um, the city council g did give direction to initiate litigation in those two matters uh, and um, the details including uh, the names of the cases, names of the parties, uh, the court, uh, all relevant details of that litigation will be made available to the public upon request once it has actually been uh, commenced. All right. No other reportable actions. Very good. Uh, Mr. White, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ms. Black, roll call, please. Mayor Galbraith? Here. Vice Mayor White? Here. City Council Member Kroll? Here. Doreen? Here. Pitts? Here. Uh, the next item on our agenda is public forum. Uh, this provides an opportunity for members of the public to address uh, the City Council on matters not on our agenda. Uh, the time limitation is three minutes. And under the Brown Act, we are not permitted to engage in any substantive discussion or action with respect to any item that's raised in public forum. Good evening, Sandy Erickson, Scott Street. And um, I would like to um, reference the uh, general plan meeting, which is scheduled for tomorrow. And um, my request is that the uh, city council at the initiation of the meeting explain exactly uh, which version of the general plan will be under discussion. Um, there are approximately three versions out there now, and um, the public, myself included, is very confused about which version will be under discussion tomorrow. Thank you. Right, thank you. Any further public comment? Uh, seeing none. Oh. Okay, very good. If you could begin by stating your name and providing your address. And I, you know, I, I don't know, uh, they got these bike events that they shut down a main thoroughfare to a hospital. I got a problem with that. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it <coughs> the three foot bike law is broken. I'm trying to uh, here, talk to you guys. I go, geez, man. Anyways, I, I, I just can't believe that they, you, let me back up. They're blocking the Silverado Trail over here to a main thoroughfare coming up, right, for a bike event? Correct? Have they done it before? Hmm. I think so. I've seen signs, and I, it just kills me going up and down the Silverado Trail and the highway that they don't need a license, especially with the farm tractors in, in California. I think the law is broken, and I think that they, that maybe, I don't know what you guys need to do, but I, my opinion, you guys... Don't block the main thoroughfares for, I get fundraisers and stuff, but, man, if I had a sick one and I need to get to the hospital, I, what, I go through St. Helena? These hospitals are on, you know. Um, you know, I get a little nervous here. I had a whole bunch of questions. They're gone right now, but I just can't see on the way home. I'm like, Ugh. Anyways, uh, let's see, I got a minute 40. Um. Before I leave, I got a question for everybody here. What is the minimum speed limit with a car to drive down a highway or a state route, when I'm state route, meaning Silverado Trail? I know you guys don't have to answer that, but Thomas and Paul, 
Hmm. You guys, I would say, but I, I, I don't know what to say. When I'm going 55 or even training my kid that's 14, 15, whatever it is, I don't know. I'm, you know, you're, you're training him to do everything. How can you write somebody up with a DUI? What is it? Let's see. If, if you're drunk in pub public, what is it, .08? I don't know. So that tells me if they don't have a license on a bike going down the Silverado Trail, but I know nobody on these bikes go to these wineries, and then they go to these fancy restaurants, and then they wine taste again. There's probably no bike companies in the Napa Valley. Wait, let me back up. In 2014, DUIs, Sonoma County, 700. Napa Valley, 600. What is a BUI? Is that a boat? Is that operating a boat under the influence, or is it a bike? So if I got a bike and I'm blowing a, I don't know, .08, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm just kind of curious if anybody can answer what the minimum requirement on the speed is on the highway or the state route. I don't know if there's any attorneys there, but all right. Uh, what? I love you guys, though. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Thank you. <coughs> any further public comment at this point in time? All right. Uh, I'll close the uh, public comment, uh, and that takes us to uh, reports by staff and city council. And let me begin with the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Mayor. Phillips. I, I do. I have two items to report out. One is um, I just wanted to bring the community's attention. We have our second survey from our community engagement program. Um, it's about community engagement. It's a short survey. It's available online or um, also by paper. The first survey we did was for the budget, and that was online only and had a much shorter time frame. This is up now and available on our website and will be open through May 15th. And the questions are really about how do we engage with the community, how can you engage with us, how can we open up those lines of communication. And so we hope everyone will go look for the survey. Um, we're also going to do some um, booths and try to get some interaction in the community as well with paper surveys and, and, and do a little bit more proactive approach with this survey. So we're very excited about it. And so I just wanted to let you know that that's up and, and we hope that people will participate. And the second item is on April 25th, on Saturday, we're going to be doing a grand opening of McCullough Park. This is very exciting for us. This has been in works for three years. And so um, we'll have some festivities. It'll take place between 11 and 3 with an official dedication at 1 o'clock. And we hope that the community, the council, um, will come out and join us and celebrate the opening of this neighborhood-inspired, neighborhood-built, blood, sweat, and tears park. Um, it's, it's really an example of community engagement and the love and care that the community has um, to be able to build a park like this. It's really great. So we hope everyone will come out and join us on Saturday. And that's in the Quinella uh, area. Yes. All right. Uh, uh, Ms. Mitz? Thank you. Ms. Black? Uh, Mr. Palmer? I have nothing. And Mr. Coniglia? And I know we're going to get to Ms. Baker in just a minute. All right. Uh, so that brings us to... Oh, council. Does it any does any member of the council wish to raise anything at this point? Well, I, just was gonna, I would just like to add a little, uh, just a little bit to what Jennifer just said. In case people don't know, Stephen McCullough was um, uh, grew up in Saint Helena, attended the local schools, and um, was a Boy Scout leader on the trip in the High Sierras, and was killed by a lightning strike in two thousand five. Right. Um, so this is the tenth anniversary. This summer will be the tenth anniversary of that, and his friends have gotten together. And um, they have a Stephen McCullough fund. They raise money. And so this is a part, a public-private partnership with his fund and the fund in his honor and the right. city. So um, really encourage everyone to come. Uh, and the mayor has nothing either uh, this evening. Uh, that takes us to presentations and public recognitions. And I think I'm going to need a drink of water before we start. All right. <laughs> Ms. Baker, our library director. Oh, no. <laughs> and so this is a proclamation for uh, National Library Week, April 12th to 18th. 
Whereas, National Library Week has been a national observance each April since 1958, providing a time to celebrate the contributions of our nation's libraries and librarians and promote library use and support. Whereas, our library employees and volunteers work continually to meet the changing needs of our community, providing resources, services, and programs for all, and bringing services outside of library walls. Whereas the library and its staff brings together community members to enrich and shape the community and address local issues. Whereas libraries are the great equalizers providing access to information, recreation, cultural experiences, and more free of charge. Whereas as local leaders, we make an investment in the future of our community by supporting our library and private donors, grant makers, and foundations who invest in libraries, likewise recognize the value of libraries for individuals, our city, and our nation. Whereas the return on this investment is evident in the commitment the library makes to the community, and even more so in the investment that individuals make in themselves as library users. Whereas the city of St. Helena this year celebrated 140 years of library service. Uh, now therefore, be it resolved that I, Alan Galbraith, Mayor of the City of St. Helena, do hereby proclaim April 12 through April 18, 2015, National Library Week. I encourage all our residents to visit the library this week and every week to take advantage of this indispensable community resource, Lives Change at Your Library. There you go. You want to say a couple words? Thank you very much, and, um, and if you haven't already heard, if you come by the library this week, you can get a free paperback off of our sales. Oh, there's actually library staff here. Hey! <laughs> yeah, so you can get a free paperback from our sale cart, and uh, today, we, we, the library gets a whole week, but the library staff gets a day. It's also National Library Workers Day, and today we celebrated with nachos, although it was also Chris's birthday. So... <laughs> So uh, thank you all very much, and uh, I'll be back. <laughs> all right, our next pro proclamation uh, is to the uh, Give Big St. Helena Steering Committee, if uh, members of the steering committee would come up, please. And this one's a challenge because there are quite a few names, and I probably am going to stumble <laughs> over one or two of them. <coughs> All right, give big St. Helena. Whereas the city of St. Helena, acting through its city council, wishes to express its appreciation for those who have generously supported give big St. Helena, and whereas this March, members of the St. Helena community are joining together to raise funds and awareness, support and improve St. Helena's public schools through a community-driven program, give big St. Helena, and whereas community members and businesses have generously provided their support for this important program, and Whereas St. Helena, St. Helena's four public schools, their students, their educators, their administrators, and the St. Helena community as a whole will enjoy valuable and enduring benefits from their generosity. And now, therefore, I, Alan Galbraith, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of St. Helena, county of Napa, state of California, and on behalf of the city of St. Helena, wish to honor, recognize, and congratulate Spotswood Winery, Jim Carroll Family Estates, Jim and Stephanie Gamble, Two anonymous friends, Continuum Estate, Gotts Roadside, Julie and Gary Wagner, Marsha Mandavi Borger and family, Timothy Mandavi family, Kathy and Frank Goltzler, Alexander and Cessna Barrett slash 38 Real Estate, Ron and Susan Krauts, Anna Canales and Bruce Screblow, Bakken Gilliam. Kroger Architects, Christina Abreu, Cottrell Cutting Family, David Miner, Grace Family Winery, Joan and Andrea Robinson, Mark Nelson and Dana Johnson, Sarah Gott, St. Helena Oddfellows, uh, Stephen C. McCullough Fund, the Ad <coughs> Anac I knew I was going to fail on this one, the <coughs> Anagnostakis Family, V. Situi Winery, on this important and generous support of Give Big St. Helena and acknowledge the many benefits conveyed to our public schools and <coughs> our community through their support. The City Council urges all citizens to join in us in celebrating their generosity and commitment to St. Helena. Now, there are <laughs>
whether you can still give even though we're beyond the 24? The next uh, proclamation is for uh, National Crime Victims' Rights Week. Uh, and do we have a representative from the district attorney's office? And you're the victim services manager? Okay. Uh, and I know I'm going to mispronounce your name, but it, is it Yucca Kamishiki? Yucca Kamishi. Okay. Very good. Wonderful to have you here. Uh, National Crime Victims' Rights Week, Rights Week, April 19th to 25th. Whereas in 1981, President Reagan first declared Crime Victims' Rights Week to help focus the nation's attention on the impact of crime on victims, and whereas crime imposes devastating emotional, physical, financial, spiritual, and social impact not only on victims and survivors, but also their family members, friends, neighbors, schools, and the entire community, and whereas this year's theme, Engaging Communities, Empowering Victims, emphasizes the role of the entire community individually and collectively to provide the necessary support, assistance, protection, and safety as victims and survivors of crime cope with the short and long-term consequences of crime. And whereas Napa County District Attorney's Office Victim Services Division is joining forces with victim services providers, criminal justice agencies, and concerned citizens throughout the county of Napa and America to raise awareness of victims' rights and observe National Crime Victims' Rights Week. Now, therefore, I, Alan Galbraith, as mayor of the city of St. Helena, do hereby proclaim the week of April 19th through 25th, 2015, as National Crime Victims' Rights Week and affirm St. Helena's commitment to respect and enforce victims' rights and address their needs during National Crime Victims' Rights Week and throughout the year, and express our appreciation for those victims and crime survivors who have turned their personal tragedy into a motivating force to improve our response to victims of crime and build a more just community. Just to say a few words. Go ahead, appreciate it. And you can sit right there. My name is Yuka Kamishi, Victim Services Manager at the Napa County District Attorney's Office. On behalf of District Attorney Gary Lieberstein, who was not able to join me today, I would like to thank you for the proclamation. This proclamation is an important component for us to educate crime victims in the community about victim assistance and community safety. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, at the Victim Services Div Division. Last year, we served over 1,500 crime victims throughout Napa County, including St. Helena. Uh, we are here to assess their needs and safety help them navigate, go through the criminal justice process, and advocate for their needs. Um, we also reach out to different communities throughout the year, but we do focus on this week and reach out to um, different communities uh, during that week. And two of the advocates will be at the Reander Center during that week also. Um, so. Once again, I appreciate your support on this. Um, I wanted to let you know uh, we can be easily reached by th uh, phone or via website. I brought some brochures, so perhaps I will give that to Ms. Black. Um, we can, uh, people can call if they would like some information or need assistance. They can call us at 707-299-1414 and we will be happy to help. Once again, thank you again for proclaiming uh, April uh, 19th through the 25th uh, of, of this year as National Crime Victims' Rights Week. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And we have one uh, final proc proc proclamation, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Uh, and uh, do we have a representative from the Napa Emergency Women's Services Group? Good, terrific. And uh, you're Judy Dern? Wonderful. All right. 
didn't have a chance to sign these beforehand, so let me just do this right now. There we go. So, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, April 2015. The month of April 2015 is Sexual Assault Awareness Month in California and throughout the United States. This year's campaign is dedicated to creating safer campuses through campus sexual violence prevention and healthy sexuality. It's time to proclaim our commitment to safer campuses and brighter futures. It's time to act, safer campuses, brighter futures, prevent sexual violence. Whereas, Sexual Assault Awareness Month is intended to draw attention to the fact that healthy sexuality means having the knowledge and power to express sexu sexuality in ways that enrich our lives. It's about every person being able to make consensual, respectful, and informed choices. There is no room for pressure, violence, or control. We will challenge unhealthy messages and stereotypes on campus, in our culture, and the media. We will use our voices to counter misrepresentations and promote respect. And, whereas, we will use our voices to share information and skills to support sexual violence prevention and healthy sexuality on campus, learn from one another, and model the respect uh, and safety we all deserve. We will connect with resources to empower us to build healthy relationships and healthy futures. For over 33 years, Sexual Assault Victim Services, a program of news, has led the way to promoting healthy sexuality and prevention of sexual violence on campus by providing 24-hour hotline service, services to survivors and their significant others, offering prevention education, responding to emergency calls, and by offering support and comfort to those impacted by sexual assault during forensic medical exams, all criminal proceedings, and empowering those impacted by sexual assault to chart their own course for healing. And, whereas news sexual assault victim services for Napa County requests public support and assistance as it continues to its effort to create a future where all women, men, and children can live free from violence and exploitation. With leadership, dedication, and encouragement, there is evidence that we can be successful in promoting healthy sexuality and preventing sexual violence in the city of St. Helena and throughout Napa County through increased education, awareness, and community involvement. In collaboration with new sexual assault victim services, we must work together to educate our community about sexual violence prevention, support survivors, and speak out against harmful attitudes and actions. We can all create positive change for safer campuses and brighter futures. It's time. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that I, Alan Galbraith, Mayor of the City of St. Helena, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2015 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in St. Helena, and I commend this observance to all citizens. So, uh, thank you very much, thank and would you like much. to say a few words? Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. You have always been so supportive of Napa Emergency Women's Services and our programs, and we truly, truly appreciate it. As the proclamation indicated, uh, sexual assault on campus has become a real big issue in the United States. Uh, in fact, it, it triggered a Senate subcommittee hearing that looked at Title IX and all the money that was given to the various universities. They tend to underreport sexual assault and a lot of other crimes that happen on campus and, and that they wanted to stop that as best they could. So in keeping with that, we have licensed the documentary entitled The Hunting Ground, which is a documentary that was shown at Sundance Film Festival this past January. And it uh, is an Academy Award nominee it will be shown on CNN sometime later this year, and as I said, we bought the rights to show it one time this coming Friday at Napa Community College in their little theater. It's free of charge, and afterwards we're gonna have a panel discussion, so I invite you all to come. If you have girls, boys that'll be going to college, if you have grandchildren who will be going to college, if you know people who will be going to college, this is a movie that everyone should see. I've left some posters in the back and uh, invite everybody to attend. Thank you so much for all your help. What time is the movie? What time what? is the movie? Oh, I'm sorry, the movie's at five o'clock from five. It's 90 minutes and then there will be a panel discussion afterwards. And I'll leave these, I have a few of these, I'll leave them in the, ba in the back. Okay, very good. On the back. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
just need a sip of water after that. <laughs> We're on the consent calendar, uh, and uh, I'm going to read through the items, uh, and as I do at each of our meetings, let me stress that members of the public, as well as uh, members of the council, can pull any item uh, from the consent calendar. And if it's pulled, then we will have a staff report, and it will go through the regular uh, discussion process. So listen carefully and let me know if you wish to pull any of these items. Item 12, consideration and proposed approval resolution approving a professional services agreement with Interwest Consulting Group in the amount of $11,540 for specifications and estimate for the 2015 pavement rehabilitation project and transferring 276601 from capital improvement project R71 to R48. 13. Uh, consideration and proposed approval of resolution adopting a revised conflict of interest code for the city of St. Helena and rescinding resolution 2012-76. 14. Consideration and proposed approval of resolution for a professional services agreement with Glen Mount Global Solutions in the amount of $21,500 for a city of St. Helena remote terminal unit upgrades, and this relates to the Meadowood tank uh, and pump station. All right, uh, number 14 is pulled. Oh, did you put? Oh, yes, I'd like to uh, pull 13. All right, uh, 13 is pulled. Let's begin with 13, uh, and uh, let me see to whom I would turn for a, a staff report. It would be uh, Cindy Black. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, this item is a routine item. It is reviewed every two years, and with changing staff and um, state law, then it can or cannot be updated. And so it, we have had some changes in staff, and so we have added, um, I don't have it right in front of me, but we, we've done some changes, and I've worked with the city attorney's office to make sure that by law we have updated, um, we have updated language and we have all of the appropriate um, positions um, listed. Do you have any questions? All right. Uh, did you wish to speak to this, Ms. Erickson? Yes, uh, this, this uh, particular issue of conflict of interest in a small town in which there are many interlocking relationships of work and uh, social lives and, and family and all of that sort of thing um, has proved to be a problem uh, specifically with the Planning Commission this last year. And um, so uh, the problem centered around, from what I could tell, the reporting and the extent of which uh, on the Form 700s, which is required every year by, um, I believe, um, elected and appointed and city employees. So a couple questions. One is that it seemed that the new language didn't mention elected and appointed. It mostly focused on city employees, so question mark one. And then um, the second question was, um, the whole issue of um, clients. Now, uh, we have several attorneys. Uh, we have uh, people that represent uh, other business interests. And oftentimes, uh, there is reporting in the name of the company or the firm, uh, but not necessarily in terms of the client. And um, we have several projects in town um, which uh, local people may be working with those clients and so it's very difficult for the city to, uh, for the people in the city to see exactly where the interests lie and therefore to determine if there's any conflict of interest. So I am asking that um, people's client lists, if they're working uh, locally with uh, people who stand to gain on different city-related projects be revealed on their 700 forms, which I think is fair. Um, and, um, and that, uh, it, that the city itself insists that those seven, 700 forms are comprehensive. Um, so those are my two questions, is the degree of comprehensive comprehension on the degree of, let's say, 
depth on these 700 forms and also exactly who is covered by that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other public comment? Uh, all right. Now let me close uh, the discussion. Uh, let's deal with this, and then I'll go back to the one I managed to skip uh, uh, before we go to yours. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, does the city staff or the city attorney wish to uh, make any further comment here? I could comment briefly just to say that, that <coughs> I think that there may be some confusion between um, annual reporting requirements under the Fair Political Practices uh, Commission's jurisdiction, the Political Reform Act, um, which is what we're dealing with here on the one hand, and um, conflict disqualification rules on the other. Those are two different um, parts of the, um, of the Political Reform Act. This conflict of interest code deals with the former, deals with annual reporting requirements. Um, the, the elected officials are, by the way, listed on this, um, and as are um, the designated employees and consultant positions. Um, it was um, reviewed by my office, and it is deemed to be in compliance with the, the Political Reform Act's requirements. Um, with respect to, I think, what what uh, the uh, the speaker was asking, which is um, when decisions are being made subject to conflict of interest rules, there are different um, conflict rules that can um, can apply. Um, and by the way, the reporting requirements that I was referring to um, previously are requirements that are set under the Political Reform Act, and and the city requires no more or no less. It's that's a. a a law that that is uh, implemented um, through the Fair Political Practices Commission. Um, the requirements of those Form 700s are set uh, in accordance with state law. Um, as for um, disqualification um, uh, uh, reporting or disqualification rules, um, that's a whole different set of regulations that we're not um, putting before the council this evening. Um, but those are rigorous requirements as all council members know um, with respect to the circumstances under which your um, financial um, relationships and financial interests um, can um, prevent you from uh, participating uh, in any given uh, decision that's before you. But the again, the, the, um, the form that is before you this evening relates to your annual reporting requirements. It's really a fairly routine uh, update that's done um, as the city clerk has told you. Let me ask one clarifying uh, question. The resolution seems to pertain strictly to designated employees uh, and they're listed uh, city employees, but the resolution or Appendix A is not covering electives. Is that? The exhibit to the resolution actually mentions the reporting requirement for um, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, on page two, um, um, refers to the reporting requirements for the city manager, the city attorney, uh, the city treasurer, econo economic vitality director, assistant C uh, ACM, uh, mayor and council, and planning commissioners. Okay. So it is listed on page okay. two of the okay. exhibit. It's <laughs> okay, that's in the footnote. Okay, or in the note. Fair enough. Uh, is there any further uh, council discussion? Uh, the chair would entertain a motion to uh, approve uh, uh, the resolution uh, adopting a revised conflict of interest code for the city of St. Helena. Move to approve. Second. Uh, Ms. Black. Vice Mayor White. Yes. Council Member Kroll. Yes. Pitts. Yes. Dorian. Yes. Mayor Galbraith. Yes. Uh, and let me uh, backtrack uh, to item 12. Uh, that remained on the consent <coughs> calendar, so I would ask uh, that item 12 be approved as our single consent item. Is there a motion to that effect? Move approval of item 12. Second. Black. Councilmember Kroll? Yes. Pitts? Yes. Doreen? Yes. Vice Mayor White? Yes. All Mayor right. Uh, uh, and then uh, 13 is going to be next, and then we'll get to 14. Uh, and Mayor Gabbard, I, I, I didn't hear your vote. Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I can see that I should have included 14 in the last motion, but I didn't, so we'll just well, do it separately. I actually wanted to just, I, I wanted to make a comment on 14. Okay, very good. All right, well, we'll consider it separately. We're, we're going to go to 13 right now. Oh, 13. 13. Well, she wanted to pull 14. Oh, does anybody wish to pull 13? We just did. We just did 13. 11, 12, 13. Sorry about that. 14. Move approval of 13. We, we just did that. We just did that. We're all set. We're on to 14. We're on to 14. Okay. Now.
Uh, oh, I, 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 did you want to make a, I wanted to make a comment. Well, let me, let me begin with a staff uh, comment on, on, on uh, 14. Mr. Palmer. Thank you. Yes, this item is to approve a professional service agreement with Glen Mount Global Solutions to provide some um, RTU or SCADA upgrades for our, our remote stations at Meadowood Tank and Pump Station. Um, we've been having trouble with the Madrone Knoll Pump Station communicating, communicating with the police station and then in turn communicating with Public Works. So there's been a lack of communication between the pump station and the Public Works staff. So we don't know when the pump station goes out sometimes and we've been getting a lot of false calls and unanswered calls. So um, this contract is to analyze the system. We think there's a radio communication problem between the station and the poli police department. So this, this contract will troubleshoot that, solve that problem for us, have calls go directly to public work staff instead of relaying through police staff, um, and then also add some low water level alarms to the tanks out there. Right now, the tanks do not have any level alarms in them, so we don't know what level they're at. And it's really, um, it's not like there's a mic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's really difficult to know to operate the system. We don't know what the tank levels are. All right. Uh, any initial comment by council? Oh well, my comment. I, I don't. I don't. This. I think that this should be approved. But um, I just wanted to comment that um, uh, we're spending this money um, for the Meadowood, uh, the Madrol Mill subdivision in the Meadowood Resort, which. I um, believe is appropriate and necessary, but I just think it's another example of why Meadow the Meadowood Resort is in the St. Helena sphere of influence and should be considered for annexation. Uh, Ms. Burnett, you had a comment? Um, well, apropos of that, uh, my name is Bobby Burnett and I'm speaking as a citizen. Um, I was just having a, a, a question about that. Is there a contractual proscription to our requesting um, some financial contribution from Meadowood for this infrastructure upgrade, which um, you know has their name at least on the pump. I, I, that was my question. I didn't know. And if it is not prescribed, is um, is there any way that we could ask for that? Yeah. Mr. If you, uh, yeah, if you like, I, I can respond to that. They are they do purchase water for the city. They are water right. users. They're they're they may not be within the city limits, but they do wa buy water from us. So they are rate payer. Um, the drone also isn't in Meadowood. Right. Any further uh, council discussion? Uh, so the answer is no. There's not a way to have them. There's not a way to cap. They're, they're, they pay. They pay um, for their water, <coughs> and so um, they're part. They're one of our water service customers. But there's not a. There's not a. Um, there's not a way to charge them for this particular expense, and and it wouldn't be appropriate to do that. <coughs> I see. I think there was a rumor I heard that they did not pay for the water. So what? that was no, that's a no, there an erroneous rumor. Please 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 Th this but comes out of the water operations budget, like right. any other right. improvement we would make in our water system, and our right. pricing of water reflects all right. of those costs. Right. Well, <coughs> what I recall from the last water rate increase was that within a year we would take another look at uh, the. Uh, the, the cost to out of city users at some point uh, that did not happen at some point that certainly needs to be revisited and somewhere deep in the res recesses of my mind I have uh, the feeling that there's a special charge uh, lift charge uh, that's in the rates for folks uh, that uh, are up in that area uh, but uh, that need, would need to be double checked uh, but I believe I'm right on that in any event at this point the chair would entertain a motion to approve item 14 so moved Ms. Black? Councilmember Pitts? Yes. Cole? Yes. Doring? Yes. Vice Mayor White? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. <laughs> All right, new business. Uh, item 15, consideration and proposed approval of a resolution approving an employment agreement with Noah Hausch, mm -hmm. did I get that close to right, to serve as the city's planning and community improvement director. Uh, Ms. Phillips? Yes, thank you very much. I'm delighted to present this item to you this evening. Um, as the council knows, um, we've been functioning with um, our very talented interim uh, planning consultant, um, Victor Carnelia, for um, nine, nine, ten months now. Um, and we did go for a recruitment for this position um, uh, in the summer of 2014. 
Um, I had just joined the city as the recruitment was closing, and one of the commitments that I made to the council and to this community and this organization is we only hire the best. Um, and I think to date I've proven that, and so we didn't find a candidate in that recruitment, and so um, we stopped, and I hired a, a professional recruiter to do a nationwide recruitment. Um, that came to flourishion um, at, uh, just about a month ago, and through a rigorous interview uh, process, um, the city has selected, and, and we do our selections as a team, uh, Noah Hausch to serve as our next community um, and um, planning and community uh, improvement director. That's such a unique title. Um, Noah comes to us from the city of Santa Rosa. Um, I do know him from my time there. Um, I didn't oversee the community development department. It wasn't one of the departments assigned to me, so he did not report to me, but we did work together, and I was able to observe his excellent work um, as senior planner at, uh, with Santa Rosa. And so I can tell you I was quite pleased when I saw his name in, in the list of um, candidates as part of our process. Um, Noah has just recently received his, bachelor's, uh, his master's in public administration from Sonoma State. We all know when we're working full time and have a family to have the initiative and the drive to, to get a master's degree um, with all that juggling is, is one of the things that really impresses me about Noah. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Humboldt State University. Um, he has uh, over 15 years of planning, project management, construction management, um, environmental policy and public administration experience. Um, he has worked on large projects and small projects, and I think for us, um, not only his um, intelligence and his knowledge in the planning arena, but also his community engagement, his style of working with the community, and a true commitment to that process was really important to me and to us. There's a difference in people who go through the community engagement process and tolerate it, because they have to, and those who really engage and feel that they're getting something out of a community engagement process, and Noah is in the latter. And that's really what we're looking for as we build a team, is to really have that person be part of our community. Um, and so I am delighted uh, this evening to recommend that the council approve uh, an employment agreement with Noah House to become our planning and community improvement director. Okay, are, are there any initial questions from council before I open the public hearing? Does anybody wish to comment at public hearing? Uh, seeing none, let me close the public hearing. Uh, any further council comment? Excited to have you on board. Thank you very much. Likewise. So I make a motion to approve. Well, before you do oh. that, I want to <laughs> simply say how <laughs> splendidly <laughs> pleased I am that you're coming on board, too. Uh, I, a number of us have been deeply involved with the planning department one way or the other uh, for a number of years. Uh, 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 both uh, Mr. Pitts, Mr. White, and myself, we all served on the St. Helena Planning Commission. Uh, Mr. Doring, I believe, served on the Calistoga Planning Commission. Uh, you escaped the Planning Commission, yeah. didn't you? <laughs> uh, went straight here. Uh, we, we went <laughs> straight to the top, so we're delighted to have you. Uh, and uh, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, have the motion passed first, and then perhaps a couple of comments. Okay, now can I you may. move to approve? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Second. Ms. Black. Vice Mayor White? Yes. Councilmember Pitts? Yes. Kroll? Yes. Doring? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. <coughs> well, welcome, welcome, Noah. Well, thank <laughs> you very much. Congrats. <laughs> please note we're breaking. Oh, I, I, I know Victor. I, I've been meeting with Victor. And, and, and uh, please note we're breaking our no clapping rule, which I typically enforce. I, I really appreciate it. It does mean a lot to me. Um, and just, I really appreciate the invitation to be here for this decision. It's a big deal for my family. I brought my lovely wife, Nicole. Uh, we decided to leave the kids at home. We thought it may add a little too much excitement to the meeting. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is a big big decision for, for our family, but also for the city, and I definitely recognize that, and I'm very honored to be a part of St. Helena. It's a wonderful community. It's an amazing place. I know I'm going to love coming to work every day. Um, and I truly am excited to be a part of the team that City Manager Phillips has put together. She, you have an excellent city manager here in uh, Ms. Phillips, and I am very excited to be a part of the team. I've met uh, most of the other folks who uh, are in executive management, and e everyone seems to be stellar, and I just want to add to that. So I really appreciate the opportunity and the support, and I'm looking forward to coming to work, so. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. All right, next All right this takes us to item 16. What, what day do you start? Yesterday. Items. Not yesterday? <laughs> 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 That's already coming. <coughs> Item 16, consideration and pr proposed approval of resolution approving a senior management analyst water conservation coordinator 
uh, for a total cost of 18800 in this fiscal year. There's not much of this fiscal year left. Uh, let's see. Item 16 and the uh, – this is Ms. Phillips, since you just – Yes, I will be taking the place of Ms. Phillips and end this item. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Palmer. So – as you stated, this, is, this item is to approve the position of Senior Man Management Analyst, Water Conservation Coordinator. The funding for this position is included in the current rate structure, and the cost for this fiscal year, which as you said is almost over, is $18,800. And the next year's cost is $117,478, and that is the fully burdened rate for the position. Um, you know, with the ongoing drought and increased uh, pressures on groundwater management in the region and recent executive orders by the governor, more regulations coming down from the state water board. Um, water conservation and groundwater management is going to be an increasingly important and critical issue to the city and important for the city to stay on top of these issues and be proactive in water conservation. So this position will allow the city to provide water conservation to its residents and also have a, a presence in the regional water issues. So it's an important part of this is not just the local aspect of implementing water conservation programs that are promulgated by the state, but also to participate in the regional groundwater meetings, regional water meetings, um, and stay on top of current legislation. Um, the staff report does outline a couple alternatives which involve not funding the position, and if we didn't fund the position, quite frankly, the city wouldn't be able to provide much level of service in this, this arena at all. It, it's, with the current staffing levels, it would be difficult for myself or whatever other support staff available at the city to, to implement a program or to attain, attend any regional meetings. Um, and then the other option outlined is to fund it, use the funds designated for the position, position to contract with a consulting firm or private consultant or maybe share resource, resources with their agency. And while this is a feasible option, as staff doesn't feel like this would be um, providing enough level of service that, that, that our residents deserve in order to stay on top of the issues. All right. Uh, let me open it for public comment. Uh, there is no public comment. Let me invite council discussion. I have a few words to say on this, but uh, if others wish to go first, please do. I, I just had a, a question or two, and I do think this is an important position because <coughs> I think long term we, we need to have. Um, I see that it was included in the budget no 12 013, not no 14 015. What about 013 014? Is that part of the budget? Is the, is the money sitting there? And, and the larger question is, with our rate structure now that we have this money available within the budget for this utility, such that it, we're not having to reach somewhere else to create this position. So I can tell you that the money is in in the rates, and so th it's available. Um, we can go ahead and, and utilize those funds, and they're they're available on an ongoing basis. Um, it's a little tough in, in looking at some of the, the records and trying to understand when it was in and out of the budget, and so I, I don't want to misspeak. We tried to provide the information that we had. Um, we didn't want to hold up the item because sometimes it takes us longer to find really detailed information. And so um, the, the most important thing for council is to understand that it is in the rates. It's a service that we're expected and, and the, um, was it not only as part of the rate increase but that the council expected us to provide we did do that through a temporary service for a while, um, but we really feel at this point with the magnitude of the drought, the type of regional issues that are going to be going on, that, that we'd like to be a, have it be a full-time position. And so it's there. The, the revenue is there to fund this position 100%. Yeah. I, I guess I'm just a little surprised the revenue is there because it's my recollection that we always we con we, we discussed and, co and contemplated this, but in the end, given our budgetary constraints, chose not to have this position there. In the budget, so I, and I'm not, and I'm not. I, I you don't even need to address that because I'm not opposed to having this position um, now, um, but uh, I don't remember it being. Th that's why it's specifically not in the budget in fourteen fifteen. I'm pretty sure it wasn't in the budget in thirteen fourteen either. Um, I don't know. I can't remember what year the rate structure was uh, reconvened. 11. But in any event, I'm. I think that we definitely should. Um, have this position. My problem with it is I just think the pay level is a little bit high considering the fact that I think our citizens are extremely um, well informed and pretty conservation oriented to start with so I'm not sure there's going to be a huge need for a lot of education and programming and that kind of thing. I do agree that um, I just 
in a perfect world, it would be fine, but it just seems like given our budgetary constraints, the pay level is a little bit high to start with. I understand, but it goes beyond. So we, we really we want to hire talented individuals, and so you know we need to pay uh, reasonable salaries in, in this valley, quite frankly. Um, it, this has a high cost of living, and so we want to attract talented individuals. When you start getting into the lower categories, it's, it's just more challenging to do that with this high level of deliverable. So it's not only in the interaction with the community and having someone that they trust, who is intelligent, articulate, who can provide the information to our citizenry, it's also the opportunity to represent St. Helena in some of these regional meetings. And we got 1.2 billion coming in the next five years from the state. We need someone who can be part of those discussions, analyze that information, be sure that we're doing things properly, and, and try to see if there's opportunities for us to, to achieve some grants in, in the monies that will be coming from the state. And so we can cut it back to a, a lower level coordinator position, but you know, HR laws require then that that person work within that capacity. And so we can't add on those, those higher level, more professional duties. And so when we looked at the job classifications, we really felt this category was the appropriate category. That's one of the questions I wanted to ask as a follow-up is, is I do understand that there's a, a lot of water conservation funding through mm -hmm. the state coming mm -hmm. in the next several years yep. that we should look at capitalizing yep. on. And, and is that one of the major roles that this position would would take on? It, it certainly would. Um, in a future agenda item, we also have a grants manager position that we're proposing to the council. And so um, this is a very technical aspect of grants administration. And so we see those two individuals working side by side. Grants is a very um, specialized field, but absolutely understanding the legislation, understanding what grant categories are out there, then putting the grant application together at times can be very technical depending on, on the types of grants we're looking for, whether it has to do with the facility or it has to do programmatic. And so absolutely, I see that as, as a critical position, especially with the 1.2 billion. I'd really like to see us jump in there and see if we can't procure some of those grant funds. I totally agree. I think, uh, I think it's very important for this, you know, given <coughs> the uh, drought legislation that, that has been passed and, and the governor's new position. And I think without having this kind of a position, we're not going to be able to get the grants and have that coordination and to be able to just stay up with the regulatory, um, you know, atmosphere of what's going on. Um, we, need, we need somebody in staff to be able to take care of that. And so I'm very in favor of this. And well. I could see a big plus and, and maybe some pretty um, sizable funds coming into the city through, you know, these kinds of uh, positions and the programs that we'll be able to uh, garner from. So. Yeah. <coughs> I have just a, a few comments here. Uh, I went back and uh, looked at the water supply plan uh, that was issued to the city back in October 2010. I recall it vividly from those days anyway. Uh, this position was very much argued for by our outside consultants at that time. I have consistently argued for this position uh, since that time. I don't see how you can run a water enterprise as we do without this type of position. You need someone that is, oh, that, that who is charged with analyzing the data. And it's not uh, just residential customers. We have commercial customers. We have industrial customers. It's very unclear to me at this point that they are doing all they can uh, to conserve water. Uh, uh, it looks to me from looking at the data but not having dug deeply into it that the residential side is, 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 doing, is doing its job. Uh, and it may be that the others are too, but clearly we need a person that follows this. And then beyond that, uh, 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 occasionally, uh, 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 and we see it from time to time, a person like this can be looking at, uh, the, uh, at what happens on a daily basis, what the meters are reporting, uh, dealing with significant leaks if they uh, show up, not personally, but making sure that they're tracked and dealt with. Uh, uh, and so uh, I am strongly in favor of this uh, position, and it certainly was uh, funded uh, 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 in the July 1st, 2011 rate increase there's a line item in there for it, it just wasn't filled. And uh, uh, I always was of the view that the city should have filled it, and uh, I certainly have said that publicly many times. So I strongly endorse uh, uh, this position, and I endorse this position 
uh, at the uh, pay scale that you urge because it is a, a person that is not just looking at our system but also looking at how we are being impacted and will be impacted by uh, state uh, regulation and we cannot afford to put ourselves in a position where we are not uh, uh, in complete compliance uh, with state regulation and risk uh, the potential fines that uh, could come to us if we are not. So I am fully supportive. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Ms. Black? I'd, I'd like to take a different tack on the issue. I, I agree that we need help in this area. I would have liked for us to have explored more of a cost sharing with uh, other entities. I, I am familiar with how they do it in Calistoga, and certainly Calistoga does not include all this, the same job duties. But they have two, uh, one lead coordinator, uh, one coordinator who works for her. They, each one has 19 hours. They handle the rebate program. They ha handle billing issues. They handle the audits in, in the residential area. Uh, they do not attend. Uh, regional meetings. Uh, I've been told that the public works director is responsible for that and that the, the manager there feels more uh, that that uh, public works director is fully capable of representing the city of Calistoga in that regard. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Mayor, that this position needs to be filled. I do not think it is a full-time position from my experience and from what I've learned uh, you know, in researching the issues. Uh, the amount of money is certainly fair. I just I, I wish we could do more to uh, maybe look at consultants cost sharing to, to share the burden because these are regional issues. And so you would think that we'd want to attack it on a on a regional basis. So I, I don't know. I, I don't real, really feel comfortable, even though it is incorporated into the rate structure that we can keep that person busy full time. And I also feel that our public works director is fully capable of doing much of the work, uh, our public works director is fully capable of doing uh, all the work on the regional basis in terms of meeting with others, monitoring uh, uh, monies that come through. Uh, I'd rather have Steve Palmer do that work than somebody else new that I don't know about. So I'm resistant uh, to uh, spending the money on this uh, without at least going through the effort of looking at cost sharing. I have a question. Is, is there a, a reason why this isn't combined with, with wastewater as well with the concept of recycling and how important that's going to be into the future? And I know there's a difficult hill to climb, but I think long term we have to be looking at that. Right now it's in the water rates, but it certainly can be, and I, and I agree with you. When you look at things like a tertiary system or things like that, you're going to start seeing how do, we, how do we produce recycled water, and so water's going to become, yeah. right, there, it's going to be hard to split the two. Um, so maybe there's an opportunity in the future to be able to draw from the wastewater funds as well. Um, I, I understand, and, and so we did put you know the alternate um, options in there. Um, I really feel from from you know each city's in a different place. <coughs> Calistoga's team has been together longer. Um, I, I think that they are not facing the issues that we're currently facing of rebuilding an organization and 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 trying to um, make things right, um, and so our ability to engage in some of these regional issues and do some of the work that maybe other department heads can do in other cities, um, we're very challenged right now. Um, one of the reasons we made it a senior management analyst is it gives us the opportunity for more flexibility. And so we hire very talented individuals. And so we thought that having that flexible um, um, t uh, title would also give us the opportunity that if I had a project or I needed help with something in the city manager's office, I could um, charge the time to the city managers to a general fund and have them work on some special projects if I needed it. And that's why we did that. We wanted someone who, if they did have some downtime, right, if, if all of a sudden things were a little bit slow and, and maybe there was a pause in some of the, the regulations that were coming out, that we could realign that individual and assign them to do some other work. And so we're, you're seeing that as we're coming forward with some of our positions. Um, because we're such a small city, we're really looking at how many things can one person do and, and we're trying to be as flexible and creative as we can. So that was one of the things we built into the position was that flexibility that they could come in and do some work for me. Okay. Yeah, it seems to me that we're also at a critical time where there is going to be a large amount of funding mm -hmm. available for um, water recycling, yep. water resources. And, and maybe this is you know, a five-year position. 
but it allows us to take advantage yeah. of that mm -hmm. influx of resources for what in really is our most precious resource, mm -hmm. and maybe one of our biggest challenges in this mm -hmm. community. So, mm -hmm. I, I understand what you're saying, Paul, but I'm 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 fully standing behind endorsing this position for that reason. And maybe in five years we don't need to continue to have that full time, but let's get after while we can and while there's funding yeah. available to help make sure we're secure for the long term. I w I would only add uh, that to my surprise, uh, the water systems between Calistoga and St. Helena are quite different. Uh, Calistoga uh, uses about 750 acre feet per year, whereas we use perhaps 1,900 acre feet per year. So there's quite a difference in the magnitude of the, of the systems. Uh, I was surprised by, by the fact that Calistoga's uh, system was much smaller in terms of delivery than ours. In any event, uh, I've said my piece on it, and so, Ms. Black, would you call the roll, please? Yeah, oh, we need a motion. Yeah. I move to approve the creation of this, uh, this new uh, position. And I'll second that. Councilmember White? Yes. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry, Councilmember Pitts? Yes. <laughs> Vice Mayor White? Yes. Councilmember Kroll? Yes. Doring? No. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. Okay. Uh, this takes us to uh, item 17, uh, and uh, I think Ms. Mitz is the lead on this item, Independent Auditor's Report on Internal Control over Financial Reporting. Yes, thank you very much. Um, as everyone knows, earlier this year we presented the annual CAFRA report, so it's a comprehensive annual financial report to the City Council and to its citizens. And what this is is just a background. It's an annual report that all municipalities are required to to complete and fulfill. A uh, secondary portion of the CAFR, and it's usually released, we usually get it typically about a month to two months after the CAFR is completed. It is a report on internal control and other matters. And what this is, it is provided to us by our auditor, and it um, points out any deficiencies of internal control processes that we might have. And it's, it's meant to be a tool for the council and for the staff to look at to address any deficiencies that we currently have in our internal controls and to make recommendations on um, fixing those controls. So what I'm going to do is just briefly, I don't, don't want to bore everyone and read the report, um, but I'm going to very briefly give you an overview of the highlights of the report. Um, two things were addressed with the City of St. Helena finances on our internal controls. The first was a material weakness. And the official definition is it is a deficiency or combination of defici deficiencies in internal control such that there is a reasonable possibility that a material misstatement of the city's financial statements will not be prevented or detected and corrected on a timely basis. Um, the second item that was pointed out to us were significant deficiencies. So this is a deficiency or combination of deficiencies in internal control less severe than material weaknesses yet important enough to merit attention. So those were the two items or the two types of deficiencies and weaknesses that were identified in our internal control. Um, out of, there's four items that were listed. We had two material weaknesses and two significant deficiencies. For all four items, our, our auditor identified there's a criteria, so basically what should be happening. There's a condition at the time of the audit, what was the condition of our financial statements. Um, the context, so a brief description of what the context was. The effect is how it impacts the city's finances. The cause, uh, the reasons, the weakness or deficiencies exist. Recommendations, and the, so the auditor makes recommendations, and then what we do is we, it's the views of, of management. So both Jennifer and I work together on actually coming up with the recommendations. Uh, we, it was, we were in agreement with every single one of the um, recommendations that the auditor had made for us. Um, as far as the cause, three out of the four, the cause was the, it was the auditor's opinion that the cause was due to severe lack of staffing and just not having the ability to get some of these things done on a timely basis. Uh, there was only one that, that was not caused by not having enough staff. Um, so I'm going to really briefly go over the four and just kind of point things out. Um, the two material weaknesses, the first is finding 2014-1. It's for capital asset accounting and depreciation. So what is supposed to happen is on a regular basis whenever we acquire any new assets over $10,000 and that have more of a year lifespan, we are supposed to be recording those assets in our books so we can do from then each year we can depreciate those assets. That is something that had not been doing at the, that was not done at the time that the, the financials had closed. 
So our plan for active actions on that is update and reconcile all assets on a more timely basis um, because it was one of the recommendations in the 2013 financials as well that just never, never was finished. And then on October 28, 2014, the City Council did adopt resolution number 2014-82, and that approved a capital asset and depreciation policy. So we do have that policy in place now. And then the third is for us to create internal procedures detailing the steps to take to record the new assets and, uh, and asset depreciation. And this ties into one of the findings on one of the other items. And we do have one designated staff member now. Um, our management analyst is going to be the designated person to actually handle the capital assets and just depreciation. So the second um, finding was uh, fund cash overdrafts and budgetary accounting. Um, when individual funds do not have enough cash in the fund to handle the uh, expenses or the expenditures, which we should never take that cash, we should never take that fund into a cash deficit. And part of this is going to be addressed a little later on in our FEMA OES presentation. And so this was um, considered a material weakness because it is what happened when we had to do the $1.9 million refund to FEMA OES. And it is um, sound municipal, municipal financial management practices generally provide that if actual expenditures in a particular fund sig are significantly higher than what the original budget is, that it should go to council for approval and that a transfer of funds takes place as opposed to having that negative cash, cash deficit in an account. Um, the plan corrective action is both Jennifer and I absolutely agree with the auditor's recommendations that um, we intend to fully comply with the, our city's budget and our city, our municipal code, our resolution, our policies in place. Um, so we have committed to, to doing that and not let the cash deficit happen in an account. Um, and then also regular review all fund balances and identify any accounts that could potentially have a negative cash fund balance and determine if it was an oversight in payment or if it was for things that were misapplied to the funds, which that, that happens occasionally and we, we do a general ledger correction. Um, the next two items were significant deficiencies. The first is citywide cash and investment accounting. What should happen similar to uh, your private financials, we should actually balance our checkbooks every month. And what happened was when the auditor did come on site in August, um, the, our cash and investment policy or our cash and investment accounts had not been reconciled to what our general ledger said since December. So we were significantly behind on that. So. We, um, yeah, so we are, wor we are, we've been working on that and our plan corrective action is actually to complete the reconciliations on a regular timely basis and immediately cure any um, issues as they arise. Uh, some of the problems that we had last year when trying to reconcile the accounts, it was we changed over our financial software system. And so unfortunately, because there was such a delayed response in, in reconciling the, our accounts to our financial statements, we discovered a lot of errors that a lot of problems that happen when we migrated, when we upgraded to our new Springbrook system that we should have been able to identify a lot earlier. So that's gonna help reconcile that issue as well. And then the final one is year-end closing reconciliation and procedures. Uh, customary normal municipal accounting practices dictate that local governments reconcile all significant general sh uh, balance sheets, revenue and expenditure accounts as part of the normal year-end closing process. And at the time the auditor came in August, the city had not reconciled and adjusted accounts as part of their normal year-end closing process. So our plan corrective actions is currently uh, myself as well as uh, some of the other finan finance department staff, we're working on written guidelines describing year-end reconciliation requirements. And we're anticipating that we're gonna have these guidelines, guidelines in place for the end of this fiscal year. So when we do work with the with the auditing firm for, the, for this current year audit, we should have a lot of that in place. Um, there's no financial impact to this report, it, um, and so the recommended action is, is to accept and file the report. All right. Are there any <coughs> initial questions of uh, staff? Is there any public comment? Uh, I'll close the public comment. Uh, you know, uh, what impresses me always is the precision with which uh, people in your profession speak. Uh, and. Uh, Precision in your profession is, of, in my view, of paramount uh, importance. And uh, uh, clearly, we had serious issues, issues that we hope we don't see again, uh, issues which I'm confident we will not see again, quite frankly. But we have to dig ourselves out of the issues, and the community broadly has to recognize that uh, it takes time and effort and 
excellent staff uh, to ensure uh, that the books and records are uh, kept well and also that you can dig back in time and see what's happened to you. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, we have new management and, uh, and I think they're getting their arms around the problem. I know they are. And that's to everyone's benefit and I appreciate it as mayor. Is there any further comment? I think we accept the report, right? I think we accept the report. <laughs> Ms. Black? <laughs> what, the I didn't catch the who made the first. I, I made the motion. And I seconded it. Councilmember Pitts? Yes. Kroll? Yes. Doreen? Yes. Vice Mayor White? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. That takes us to item 18. Uh, <coughs> it's. Uh, FEMA OES refund update. This is the update that was promised uh, to us uh, at this time, uh, perhaps five weeks ago. I don't remember precisely six weeks ago. In any event, uh, it's Ms. Phillips. So I'd just like to take a minute to thank Director Pitt, uh, Mitz. <laughs> that works. That was too close. <laughs> <laughs> Director <laughs> Mitz. Um, right? <laughs> I know. Um, I don't think your wife would appreciate that. Peter, um, you might be a little more loud. She really did um, the yeoman's work behind pulling all the information together to understand what happened. And you know, when you go back in time, it's th these are challenging research efforts. And so I really want to thank her for the time and energy, her staff, her tenacity um, to put this report together, to write it in a, in a way that I think is very clear. Um, and I hope that it's helpful to the community and the council to understand um, and also appreciate her thoughtful recommendations as we move forward. So I'm going to turn it over to April for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, it is a labor of love, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, so the little bit of the background on the February 10th council meeting, we presented the, the annual financial report to the council and to the citizens. Part of our report included a 1.9 reimbursement that was done to FEMA OES um, for a refund for the, our, flood, our hazard mitigation flood protection plan that the city of St. Helena had. Um, the discussion portion of it is the findings in this report come from ser several sources. Well, Jennifer and I went through a lot of different avenues and resources, and we are continually finding, finding things. So the process is still not done. There might still be stuff that comes up. Um, but in this report, um, where we got our primary information was information received by contacting OES. OES, what they do is they, the funding comes from FEMA and it goes through OES, and so they facilitate it and they work with the individuals that actually do receive the grant funding. Um, so we did, we did have contact um, correspondence and many, many phone calls with, with representatives at OES. Um, we researched the finance, um, the finance documentation and files, and then we did also hire a private uh, third-party investigator to actually conduct interviews with former staff members um, just because we wanted to make sure that the interviews were completely impartial and that they could try to try to um, ask some questions to some of the answers that every, you know, we as staff and then as council and as citizens wanted to address. So that's where the information came from for this report. And the timeline of it, in 1998, FEMA declared disaster 1203, so you'll see DR 1203 on a lot of the documents due to El Nino. What uh, DR1203 did is it allowed for 404, 404 grant funding to be available from FEMA. 404 grant funding is specifically for hazard mitigation, and so that's where these funds came from. Uh, total funding that St. Helena had received was over a little over $8 million was the total funding we received. Between the years 2002 and 2007, the St. Helena received uh, $3.5 million in grant funding. And then in 2012, um, the current finance or the finance director at that time petitioned for another $4.5 million from FEMA. And so it was, it looks like from everything we tell us the additional $4.5 million that we applied for in 2012 of that 4.5, $1.9 million is what we had to actually refund back to FEMA because we could not provide documentation for those, for those particular items. The, ne uh, the next thing that happened is after we received the, mon the money prior to FEMA closing out any of their projects, they do provide or they do, they do an audit on any entities that had received funds. And so what they did is they came in, they were on site for about a week and they worked with the finance director, finance staff in trying to locate all the documentation needed to justify the funds that we received through FEMA. And then what their findings were after that, 
week-long process is their findings came up with the, with the $1.9 million that were either unaccounted for, were allowable, or were, were unacceptable as far as that goes. So the next, the next section gives a timeline. I'm not going to read them verbatim, um, but it's a timeline of the correspondence that happened between FEMA OES and the city of St. Helena. Um, so FEMA sent a notification to OES, OES sent it to St. Helena, um, stating that they were deobligating those funds because we could not provide the proper documentation. Every time that they gave us a letter um, informing us, we had 60 days to file an appeal. And so an initial appeal was filed by the finance director um, with a justification for, it was, I believe it was $938,000 out of the $1.9 million. OES came came back to us and asked what we used as, as documentation and justification for that $938,000. Um, the finance director said that they looked at the projects and they compared it to the circular that was provided to us by FEMA OES for the original grant. Um, so that's what they said they used. After that, FEMA OES came back and said that they, although they appreciate the information that they did not agree with our findings and they were deobligating the funds and again offered us a 60 day 60 days to appeal that decision um, after that uh, that last or the last letter that came to the, the finance department they did have 60 days prior to that 60 days being being exhausted um, the previous finance director did email uh, OES stating that she would not be able to complete the detail asked for before she left and that she did not think anyone in St. Helena had the detailed information that FEMA was requesting. And so that was something that she had sent to FEMA OES. OES did respond back saying, I just want to confirm in writing that, that you are deobligating the funds. And at that point she responded saying her and the current city manager at that time, Broad, did agree that they, they needed to deobligate the funds. So after that point, they, um, we did receive the invoice from, from OES for the $1.9 million. And then what had happened was they, it, we had an okay on the, on the document, it says okay to pay um, per Gary. And then it had the interim finance director's initials on it. And all of the supporting document is documentation for this is behind the report. So they did do the refund to FEMA OES and it um, did bring that fund balance in the negative of approximately $1.6 million. One of the questions that, that had been asked was if the city does have current policies for paying out these types of, these types of refunds or making any type of adjustment to the budget, and um, the answer is yes, the, the city does have policies in place. The next section looks at the, the current policy for the disbursements of funds. It is listed in the municipal code, it's listed in the budget document, and it's also listed in the budget, resol the budget resolution. And each of these items um, very clearly state that the city manager does have the authority to transfer appropriations between apartments, departments so long as the total appropriations are not increased within a fund. It also says that the city council has an overriding authority of control on, on any budget item. And it says the total appropriations in any fund may not be increased except by the city council. So all of our policies, three different areas, it does state that the city council is the only person or is the only body who has the authority to be able to approve that type of expenditure that would have gone out because it would have, we would have had to make a budget adjustment and increase the budget. Um, by de definition, we talk about appropriations in here. So by definition, appropriation is an authorization by a legislative body, which is our city council. Um, from doing the research on it, um, we had talked about several recommended policy changes to ensure that this does not happen again. Um, the first is one thing that we do want to continue doing. It has always been the policy before, but I don't think it's really been done for a while, so we want to continue, is having quarterly, quarterly reports to the city council on the budget status. And we're recommending that this take place at regularly scheduled city council meetings. So not in a city manager weekly, not via email to the council members in your regular correspondence, but actually in a, in a public forum that is a, a documented forum. Um, the second is to provide quarterly reports to city council on grant status to take place also during regular scheduled council meetings. And we're proposing that the report should include, but it's not limited to 
new grant funds that are being sought so you're aware of what grants are out there new grant funds that we've received um, upcoming audit upcoming grant audits every time you do have an audit you typically have one to two months if not more notification that an audit is going to be taking place um, on any audit results and any grant appeal status so if there's any grant if there's any appeals that we're doing for grants providing regular updated reports to the council um, one of the third recommendation we are having is to provide a monthly check warrant list to council. Um, this is something that had happened in the past, and over the past couple of years, it had, it had stopped occurring. So we're recommending that we do provide you monthly check warrant list to the, to the council for all warrants. And then we're also suggesting that we highlight any warrants exceeding a set dollar amount, for instance, $100,000, $50,000, whatever the council deems appropriate. And then what we are committing to do also on those reports next to the line item, stating whether that was an approved budgeted item, if it was approved by resolution, if what, what project it's approved for. So the public and the council is very much made aware if it is actually a budgeted item and if it's not a budgeted item that, that you know we should have actually come to council to do a budget adjustment and approval on that item. Um, the next item is that it, we as a team, you're the executive management staff, we do commit to following all process procedures and protocols set forth by the council by law or by city officers authorized to allow the same. Um, the fifth is to create a comprehensive grant administration program. And what this would do is this would include a full review of the scope of work for each grant prior to the request for funds to ensure the, availabil the ability to comply with grant regulations. Um, for the additional $4.5 million that we received from FEMA, through our research, it was found that they, a general ledger was used to request the refund because it was for funds that the city had already spent. And so what, what should have happened is prior to, prior to the refund being sought, every single piece of paperwork should have been pulled to be able to justify exactly what composed of that $4.5 million. Using a ledger entry is, it's basically, I won't say that. It's, it's basically not doing your due diligence and it's just looking over a spreadsheet of sorts seeing that we paid out this particular contractor, this dollar amount, and then assuming that it was for flood protection and for hazard mitigation, as opposed to actually pulling the invoices and verifying every single thing. So that's what a proper grants administration program would do. Um, they would also, this program would also closely monitor grant funding projects to ensure adherence to the scope of work designated for each grant. Um, in several of the correspondences that we found, it did state that the scope, our interpret, the city's interpretation of the scope of work and FEMA's interpretation of the scope of work seem to be out of line, but as anyone who's ever received grant funds know, whoever the person is giving you the money, their scope of work is gold, and that's what scope of work you actually, you actually follow, and their, their interpretation is what you actually wanna look at. The next thing to do is for reimbursement grants, funds are to be requested only after all documentation, documentation has been reviewed for compliance with the scope of work, and all supporting documentation is accounted for. The next item that, the, that this program would do is that all grant funding documentation is properly maintained for the required time frame. Um, the city does have, we do have document retention schedules. However, if we receive outside funding, each different funding source has different time, time requirements that you have to keep documentation. So even if the state or state federal policies say you can destroy it after maybe three years, if you are receiving grant funds, for instance, with FEMA. FEMA requires you to keep all documentations from seven years, seven years after the close of the project. So even though we started receiving funds in 2010, this project closed out in 2014, we legally have to keep the records till 2021 because they can come, by, come back at any point and actually do an audit on it. Um, and then also exhaust all appeals, this uh, having an extensive program would exhaust all appeals available to the city if refunds for grants are being sought. Um, we wanna make sure that we don't, we don't not file every single appeal possible after talking to several people at OES and, and other people who do, all they do is do grants, is um, they said, the last thing FEMA and OES wants to do is actually have to do a refund to you because it creates a lot of work on their end. And then it also opens up those grant funds for other entities 
to apply for refunds, you know, using those grant funds. So it takes a lot of extra work. So several people I talked to said the last thing they want to do is refunds. So they they like you to exhaust all of your all of your appeals and and they want you to be able to keep the money. Um, the last recommendation that we have is to approve a full-time permanent grant manager position. So that's the next item on the agenda tonight. Um, and what this would do is it would allow three main things for this position. It would allow forensic research for awarded grants, including the $1.9 million FEMA OES refund. And this will also include all aspects of seeking reimbursement for a, per a portion or all of that FEMA OES. Um, after talking to several people who do do grant funding and they're very familiar with the process and working with FEMA OES and it is possible that we might be able to actually um, seek some of those funds or find other grants available that we can get some of that funding refunded by other grants. Um, the second thing that this position would do is to create a comprehensive grant administration program for the city and then the third thing is seeking and securing grant funding for various uh, projects and departments. As we stated earlier with the water with the water money that's coming up there there is a lot of different funding available out there and having the proper person in place to find that money for the city I, I think would be very very beneficial and um, there's no recommended ac action on this particular report um, there are attachments to it and so if anyone has any questions I know it's it's long it's comprehensive it's detailed and there's more information out there <laughs> I, I have one question um, on this on this list attached to their um, June 25th, 2013 letter, there's a list of expenses that were you categorized as U unallowable, Q questionable, and A allowable. Mm -hmm. And so the ones, the allowable ones that we, that were deemed part of the 1.8 million, was it just because we didn't have backup or was it be pre-2007? It was, it was, we, if it was pre-2007, there was some documentation there, but not all documentation. And so from my correspondence with, with OES, it did sound like some of those were because we actually did not have their proper documentation. So when I read through, there's two, actually two lists. There's the, the list they sent to us, and then there's a, a distilled down list of, of ones we came back and said, hey, by the way, we've got 983,000 here that we've looked at and we think these should be supportable. They were either Q or A's. A um, couple of questions. So the U's, which were unallowable, they mostly seem to be relocation assistance, and but then there are a couple of relocation assistance that were Q's, questionable, that may have been accepted. Is that just outside of the purview of this type of grant money? It's not what, moving someone out of the way of the, f of the floodplain, I guess, isn't, uh, wasn't allowed in this? Well, some of the... Wait, 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 wait one at a time, please. Let the and then uh, secondary okay. to that, so that's one, one question, but it related, when we went back and said this other $983,000, right, they came back and said, there doesn't seem to be enough backup here. And right. Karen's response was, I can't get that backup before I leave my post in this job. So if we can find the backup, <laughs> did we have a chance of getting a refund of at least that 983? And you know, can you comment on that? That is something that we'll have to look into. What happens with 404, 404 grant funds from FEMA? Once the grant is closed, it's closed. And so once we refunded the money back um, another entity more than likely because this was a you know, federal it was a statewide grant for california and so what had probably happened was any other entity that might have had some outstanding funds that they sought reimbursement for more than likely they sought that reimbursement all the funds were spent they they do not add anything extra to that to that grant and so f it is from what we've heard from FEMA OES, it doesn't sound like they would reopen it, but we are gonna exhaust all avenues to make sure that they aren't gonna reopen it. And if they don't reopen it, we're looking at seeking other grants from FEMA OES where those might be allowable expenditures. Okay. Ms. Oh, Ms. I was just gonna say that I think that one of, the, one of the explanations for this is when we started the flood project, a certain number of Vineyard Valley units were remo permanently removed and I'm guessing that some of the relocation um, that was allowed may have been related to those units and not necessarily somebody who was flooded. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I also just want to point out, I'm sure you probably didn't find documentation of this, but when we started the flood project in 2008, when the construction started, we, we did pass a, a, a 
I don't know if it was an ordinance, but um, we had a rule in place that any check cut over $10,000 related to the flood project in any way, shape, or form needed to be approved by the council. And I'm guessing then that obviously did not. Yeah, we had not seen that documentation. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, are there any other questions of uh, staff on item 18? Uh, you're not requesting any action with respect to item 18. We'll move to item 19 in just a moment, but I've got a couple of comments myself, unless other council members wish to go first. First of all, I want to thank staff once again for the substantial effort that went into bringing these uh, facts to life. Uh, the staff report is an excellent report, uh, highly readable, even if written by accountants, you know. <laughs> it's very clear that the city was informed of its appeal rights. It's very clear that the city did not meaning meaningfully pursue those appeal rights. To me, when you read this documentation, it comes across that senior staff, former senior staff, essentially gave up on the matter, just gave up. Obviously, the fiscal impact is large, and uh, I think for all of us, this incident is exceptionally uh, upsetting. And I'm about the only, the, about the only uh, further comment I can make is that, uh, is that uh, you know, I hope that there is some further recourse, obviously, uh, with FEMA. Uh, but I can also understand that once you've refunded the money and the money has gone to uh, other uses, uh, that, your, uh, that your position uh, is compromised. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, obviously, uh, staff is committed to doing whatever it can to, to uh, mitigate uh, the situation. And then uh, that moves us, I think, to the next item since... Uh, Oh, uh, is there any public comment? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the staff report said that uh, Mr. Broad has yet to be interviewed, and I'm wondering if he has been interviewed and if, and if any further information came from that interview. Good Thank question. You. Um, as far as we know, the interview had not taken place as of yesterday, and so we are waiting. We The interviews had been completed for the other two staff members, and Mr. Broad has not been completed yet, and as soon as it is completed, if it changes any of the information, definitely report back. Right. Any, I'm assuming I the interviewing. I heard of a third-party investigator. Yeah. Is, uh, is there any other public comment, uh, Ms. Burnett? Keeping it to wondering. item 18. We'll get to 19 in just a moment. <laughs> I was just wondering how to get a copy of that report. Is that online? Was it? Uh, yeah. Are you referring to the staff report? Yeah, report. Oh, yeah. The staff report is online. It's part of the regular <coughs> agenda. It's online, and if you click on the agenda item, I think it's agenda <laughs> item number 18. If you click on it, the full report will pull up. All right. Uh, so, uh, no action is sought uh, with respect to this item. Uh, uh, Ms. Mitz, I think. Can I just ask one question? Oh, yes, of course. Um, there's uh, mention of $3.5 million in the Measure 8 <laughs> fund right now. Can you uh, talk to us about that a little bit, how we can access and when we can access those funds? What is happening with the Measure A money because it's getting close to the sunset of Measure A? Um, the the authority took out bonds on behalf of several several entities that are part of the authority, and what they use is they use the proceeds from measuring money to be able to pay down the bonds, and so that, that enabled the cities and entities to get funds early. Since it's getting close to the sunset of Measure A, what they are doing is they are actually holding the funds there to ensure that we, we can, or so that, so to ensure that they can pay back the debt obligation. So currently the total debt obligation is $5.2 million. Right now we have $3.5 million in Measure A funds, plus approximately about $1.2 million of future funding that's gonna be coming in from the city of Napa for a loan repayment. So as soon as those two totals plus the Measure A funds that come in exceed the $5.2 million, we can do the drawdown, additional drawdown to be able to pay back Measure A funds. Thank you. That's having the numbers in your head, isn't it? Well, I wanna make one last comment. Because of the lack of documentation to say to ourselves that <coughs> sloppy job and, and it's upsetting that we've had to refund this money, but it's also possible that perhaps we weren't careful in, in terms of how we interpreted what could be spent on with, with these funds, how we could spend these funds. And so I think on a forward basis, the lesson we can learn is that we, we maybe 
need to be careful and perhaps conservative in terms of how we interpret grant funds and how they can be spent so we don't find ourselves having to write refund checks in the future, right? Well, I think that's gonna bring us to the next item and the importance of a grant administrator who understands what the uh, requirements are uh, from uh, federal and state agencies. And I think we already heard uh, from Ms. Mitz that those can vary uh, among agencies. And so let's turn to the next item, item 19. Uh, uh, and uh, I think you probably substantially covered it, but uh, 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 please staff report. I don't think there's too much more I can add to that. Um, as you, everyone is aware, on February 27th, we did have a goal setting session to identify our priority objectives for the upcoming year. One of the major, the major priorities that we had was focusing on the overall goal of securing the city's financial future. Um, grants are a key revenue source that can provide essential funding for capital improvement projects, emergency preparedness, public safety, innovative community programs, you know, to serve our community. There are a lot of different grants out there and um, having a dedicated staff member, we feel would really be able to research the grants, put together a grant program for us. And part of that, as, as Council Member Pitts alluded to, was actually being able to look over what the qualifications are for the grants and make sure that we stay within those qualifications. Um, the responsibilities of this position, covered it during the last report, is to provide forensic research for awarded grants. That will include the $1.9 million FEMA OES, as well as our Measure A audit that we're gonna be coming up at the close of Measure A. We, they will be conducting an audit as well, just to make sure that we have all the correct, fund, all the correct items ready for that audit. It's gonna be created a comprehensive grant um, administration program, and it's gonna also look at seeking and securing grant funding. Um, currently, we do not have a dedicated staff member to develop a proper grant program, and we th really feel that we're underutilizing the amount of federal, state, and local funding that, that is available to the city. The fiscal impact um, is the same type of position as the water, wastewater, um, or the, the water position, so it is a senior administrative analyst. A total of $19,000 um, we'd like to appropriate for the end of this fiscal year. And then for next fiscal year, it would be $117,500. And that is salary and benefits. So that's just not the salary portion, it's overall right. compensation for the position. Um, so it is our recommended action that we do approve this position. Um, the alternate um, option is if we don't approve this position, um, we really don't have the staff capacity to, to try to try to seek out additional grant funding. We'd have to do grant funding on a case-by-case -case basis on project, and then we'd have to look at the staff available to actually administer those grants. Um, the other thing that we would look at doing would be hiring an outside consultant to come in and, and complete the forensic accounting for us that we need for the FEMA OES to see if we can actually get recoup any of those funds or seek other grants as well as for the measure a because we do want to have full forensic accounting done for measure a prior to the close of measure a so we have about a year and a half for that and we want to make sure that we have everything in place prior to that audit taking place all right any initial comments uh, from staff from council i think it's a great idea and i do think we better get started now on <laughs> justifying that for this measure a I, I, <laughs> I, I would only add uh, that, uh, for example, uh, the removal of that, I always say that damn dam, uh, uh, was always on my mind because it's <coughs> been on the city's mind since maybe 1996 or 1997. But there is an example where we're a million dollars short uh, and where in fact there might well be private funds available as opposed to federal and state uh, <coughs> funds, but nevertheless, funders have grants, they require grant administration. And my further understanding is that if you're successful in getting grants, at least with some grants, uh, the cost of getting the grant comes out of the grant itself. So there is some opportunity uh, as you move forward to, to engage in some uh, cost recovery with respect to the person that, that you're hiring. Uh, so with that, uh, is there any uh, public comment? Uh, Ms. Erickson? I'm sorry for being up here so often this time, but um, the grant uh, and also the water uh, uh, positions are um, extremely critical to this city. Um, Napa College, when I was on that board for 12 years, literally built that place on Judy Walter Burke's grant writing. She just died recently. But um, I can tell you 
from years at City College in San Francisco that when you write a grant, uh, the people that review those grants, those are the same kind of people that work for things like CSI. I mean, they are forensic, you know. I'm not kidding. And you could be tossed out of the, out of the uh, candidate list <coughs> just if you use the wrong buzzwords mm -hmm. because it connotes a sort of uh, lax thinking or not being current. So um, the competition for that is fierce, particularly in the state of California. And the people that don't recognize that huge amounts of income come from those grants, um, I would say, just judging from what I know about grant writing and having written some grants, that uh, <coughs> it's going to equal what TOT brings in if it's done really well and you have a real star at it. Um, it is a science. It is an art form. And it's where the money comes from. And not only that, on the other end, no one keeps track of how many grants you got. The grants go to the people that do it right, no matter how many they already got. So, um, you know, it's, it is a money-making machine. Well, <laughs> let's, let's hope. <laughs> All right, any further public comment? Let me close the uh, public comment. Any further council discussion? Uh, then uh, I would invite a motion to uh, approve uh, the position as set forth in item uh, 19. So moved. Second. Ms. Black? Vice Mayor White? Yes. Council Member Kroll? Yes. Pitts? Yes. Dorian? No. Uh, Mayor Galbraith? Yes. That takes us to item 20. I'm going to read the title. Uh, appeal of the February 3, 2015 Planning Commission decision to deny a demolition permit, parcel map use permit, and design review in order to demolish an existing single-family residence, subdivide the existing parcel into two parcels, creating a flag lock, <coughs> and develop a two new two-story single-family residence on each of the new parcels at 1837 Pine Street in the medium-density residential district. Uh, for better or worse, I live within 500 feet of that property, and therefore, uh, by state law, uh, I am recused, and I give the gavel to the vice mayor, Mr. White. <coughs> so we'll give you time to leave and go home, <laughs> since this is the last item. <laughs> Wisely <laughs> made last. <laughs> I'll take care of the adjournment. <laughs> okay, very good. <coughs> so we'll first hear the uh, staff report uh, from Mr. Carnelia. Yes, um, <coughs> Vice Mayor, members of the um, of the council, council, uh, as you're. Oh, aware uh, has a very detailed staff report in front of you that uh, goes through um, the project in, in, in detail and covers a whole range of issues. So I'm not going to repeat what's in there, but just kind of touch on some of the major points. In terms of the project itself, itself staff has um, a number of concerns, uh, uh, significant concerns, and those revolve around probably three central is issues. One is the question of privacy impacts. The other is neighborhood compatibility, and uh, the other one is uh, remaining one lack of compliance with the zoning code. Um, is also indicated in the staff report, there is a whole host of findings that have to be made by uh, any decision maker on this project, by council in relation to the use permit, parcel map, et cetera, uh, based on the nature of the, the development project as discussed and uh, analyzed in the staff report. Uh, staff feels it's it's not possible to make those findings. Um, in terms of getting touching on the zoning code uh, aspect of the project, there are a number of concerns. One um, having to do with the um, the width of access to the flag lot, not complying with the uh, code requirement. Um, the actual lot as it currently exists is substandard, at least in terms of its um, rear width. Um, and a lesser issue, but still one based on, on the way the plans are currently submitted is 
uh, there's not adequate pr parking provided for the second units. And I guess the remaining issue touched on also in the staff report is the timeliness of the appeal. Uh, a couple other issues worth um, bringing up. One is the issue of past precedents. Uh, this issue came up uh, during the planning commission process. Uh, the applicant indicated um, and, and brought up a number of um, uh, precedents that they felt uh, backed or, or substantiated uh, their proposal. Staff uh, looked at a number of those. There were, there were uh, quite a few. Uh, we noted some things. In some cases, they were current. Other cases, they uh, dated back uh, many years, 20, 30, 40. Uh, in some cases, uh, more than 50 years. Uh, and in a number of ways, the projects, um, they all didn't differ, but the majority differed uh, from the proposal uh, in, in their own unique ways. Uh, other projects, the uh, rear lot was substantially larger, therefore allowing for greater setbacks in terms of uh, siding a building on the rear parcel, um, at least as compared to the uh, project currently before the city council. Uh, related to that is simply proximity to surrounding structures. In this case, surrounding structures are very proximate to the, um, to the subdivision, and in other cases, uh, that's not so. And, and one uh, kind of fundamental issue, I guess, is simply neighborhood concern. In the previous cases, or a number of previous cases, there wasn't significant or really any uh, neighborhood opposition. And clearly, in this case, there's uh, significant concern, interest, at least, um, as documented to date uh, at the um, at the planning commission level, um, there in looking through the cases, though, there were some mistakes made in the past in terms of consistency uh, with the zoning code, way based on the way it's written, as compared to what what was uh, approved in the past. Um, uh, but simply because states mistakes were made, city is not condemned or forced to repeat those same mistakes. Uh, and I guess the kind of moral of the story is in the end, um, each project really has to stand on its own merits. Um, f final point relates to um, this question of a, a modified plan. And there was a, a, a memo that went out to you today. And um, this is a plan the applicant's going to be uh, submitting tonight. It's actually a plan that came up uh, back during the planning commission process in September. Uh, as staff understands it or is, uh, has been uh, described or submitted it, um, it eliminates the second unit on the, um, on the home on the rear parcel, which does uh, improve um, the um, uh, privacy and massing impacts, uh, but the um, building still is second sto uh, two story. Uh, there's a proposal to add some mature trees to uh, to screen windows, um, and it adds um, a bedroom kind of uh, in in uh, compensation, I guess, for eliminating the second unit on the uh, on the back parcel. Um, in terms of the plan, and once again, the applicant will be um, showing it to the uh, to the uh, council here tonight. But uh, staff, in looking at it, felt feels that it, that while it does improve on the privacy issue, it's a it's a, sm a small benefit. The overall impact of the t massive, large two-story uh, homes proposed on both lots is still there, although somewhat lessened by um, the reduction on the, um, the home in the back. Um, part of the proposal is to uh, kind of, as I indicated, kind of an exchange for adding or removing the uh, second unit on the home in the back is to allow um, additional square footage for the home on the front. And to do so, uh, it requires an interpretation of the code from staff standpoint is inconsistent with the way the code is written. Essentially, um, uh, the code as written does not allow the, um, the access way going to the rear parcel to count toward the front parcel in terms of computing FAR. Um, currently, the um, home on the front parcel is right at the maximum FAR floor area ratio allowed. And to allow it to, um, to get bigger uh, or to expand, um, part of that driveway area would need to, uh, uh, the driveway area leading to parcel two would be need to be counted as part of parcel one. And lastly, uh, staff feels that the, um, 
where the, uh, the planting is definitely helpful. Um, staff feels that there's an over-reliance on, on planting. Um, planting, I think, is from staff's experience, is effective if you're trying to avoid a view of something, if you have a building or a home that backs up against some objectionable kind of use and you want to prevent uh, and screen the view of that from the people in that home. Um, in this situation, we're looking at privacy impacts on the surrounding uh, uh, homes, and uh, my guess is, and I think part of the reason, um, uh, conjecture on my part, but the, uh, the applicants uh, keen on getting a, a two-story home on both parcels is because there's views to be had outside of, um, from those windows, and, and uh, if one uses landscaping as a screening technique, uh, if the um, folks that live in those homes uh, feel that they're impeding the view in some fashion, clearly that landscaping can be screened. So I think landscaping is not a bad thing. It's just not a panacea or a, or a cure-all or, or a solution to the privacy impacts. Uh, and s just to sum up then from a recommendation standpoint, um, staff uh, recommends that the city council deny the appeal uh, for the reasons discussed, uh, both in this presentation um, and in the report. Um, staff also recommends that council deny uh, the proposal without prejudice. Uh, there are uh, a number of provisions included in the staff report, different ways of uh, improving the propo proposal and from a staff perspective, uh, better addressing the privacy and massing and other issues. So. Uh, denial without prejudice uh, would allow the applicant, if they so choose or chose, to uh, to modify the plan and come in with a revised plan that uh, that is uh, consistent or more consistent with those provisions. So um, that's the end of my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So, council members, have any questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, um, we're going to open up the public hearing, but uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we're going to limit the applicant to 15 minutes, and then any other uh, public comments will be three minutes in length, and then the applicant can come back up for rebuttal uh, for five minutes at, <coughs> at the very end of the public comment. So. So let's open up the public comment. Hi, good evening, everyone. I, I uh, that's a tough act to follow, Victor. <laughs> um, and if you could that. state your name. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm uh, Dave Wright. Uh, I reside here in San Elena uh, with my family, my three children, and my wife. Um, I'm a member of 1837 Pine Street LLC, along with the applicants, my uh, Mark Kay, my father-in-law and our family friend, Michael Fawn. Um, I know I have 15 minutes, so I have to go very quickly through this because um, there's a lot to get through. And um, you can change the slide, please. Uh, so, so we're here tonight because uh, we believe that the Planning Commission to appeal their decision. I know this is de novo, and I guess it's a whole new hearing, but we're here to, to, to appeal their decision because they acted arbitrary and capricious in their decision. They established new ru rules for our, for our project, which they don't apply to anyone else as a double standard. We followed every rule, every code, every guideline by the city, and yet we get denied. And other people and other projects, you know, I don't know what that's based on, but we followed every single rule and every single guideline. Uh, if you overturn, if you had granted the appeal, you'd be consistent with previous matters that this board has heard on appeal. And lastly, we ask for fair treatment, just like any other applicant. People that have lived here 30, 100 years, we haven't. I've lived here six years, but we like fair treatment just like any other applicant. Uh, real quickly, uh, just quick site plan. Uh, there's a, uh, my pointer doesn't work on the screen. Um, so we have a front, we have a flag lot situation here. We don't have an actual flag lot. The back lot is, uh, is an easement uh, through the front lot. We have two homes, they're not McMansions. Uh, staff just said they're massive homes. The back house is a massive home. It's a 2,300 square foot house. That's hardly massive in town. That's pretty average. That's probably below average what's being built now, but I would, I would argue with, uh, with staff that that's a massive house. Go to the next slide, please. 
Uh, this is a, a rendering of the front house. It's, it's a modest 2,276 square foot home. There's a 400 square foot guest unit. This was denied by the Planning Commission. This is the original submitted plan. Moderately sized home, not a McMansion. I've heard that by opposition saying these are McMansions, hardly McMansions. The back house is a barn inspired. A lot of these going up in town. I've seen them all over the place. This is 2,300 square foot. There's a 400 square foot guest unit that was denied by the Planning Commission. We have an alternate plan that removes that, which would change that. And like I said, staff just said this is a massive house. This is hardly a massive house. It's 2,400 square feet. Uh, just some quick notes. When we purchased this property, the, 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 the property was, was marketed as a potential lot split. So the sellers had that in mind for buyers like us to come in and research that with the city, which we did. We met with the former planning director or interim planning director, Greg Desmond. He told us this was ideal. It's a perfect, perfect lot to be split. The way the topography of it, the shape of it, the existing houses around it, the distances there are, it'd be ideal. We relied on the city's advice and we purchased this property. It was consistent with the general plan they told us and also the zoning. Some quick design highlights, they're family homes, they're architecturally designed to keep the historical character of the west side, and we, uh, we mitigated the second floor privacy concerns. That was a big concern of ours, we mitigated those. Staff doesn't believe landscaping is, we believe it does. We elevated wil sin uh, window height sills, so you can't just sit in front and look out a window down, it's f almost five feet high. So our alternative design option, which I'm not even sure if the city council has even seen it, we don't know that. We got no feedback from the staff whether this is presented. We don't know if you've seen this or not. I mentioned some of this to some of you when I met with some of you. Uh, those highlights on the alternative option, we propose to re remove the rear house guest house facing the POTS property. That also eliminates an exterior staircase, second floor windows. It also pushes back the second floor of the, f of the back house an additional 14 feet from the property line. So there's not a large wall facing a massing scale, it pushes it back. It's a pretty big distance. Uh, staff is trying to say it's a quid pro quo. We, we, we do this, you get that. These are separate issues. We're, we're, we're trying to mitigate the privacy concerns by the pots by removing the guest, guest house in the back. Separate issue, we're also asking for fair treatment Recently, approvals by the city included 16-foot driveway easements. We're being required 20. My understanding, this has always historically comes from the fire department. They're okay with, with 16 feet. That's why it's been approved in the past, and that's why it's not an issue. But with our property, 20 feet is, is being asked, not getting treated fairly. We're being treated against. And all we're asking for is the FAR calculation, which is how big a house the front house can be, be, be impacted. We're not changing the width of the driveway. We're not changing the width of any landscaping. It's exactly the same as if there was a 20 foot required driveway and, land and, and landscaping easement. Driveway is still 16 feet wide. There's still landscaping two feet on each side or more on one side. So we're not, we're not asking for anything different. We're just asking that we're treated fairly just like everyone else when they get 16 foot driveways to calculate how big a house can be built on the front lot. And lastly, part of this uh, proposal to the, city, to the city council and the city was a global resolution regarding all pending claims between the parties. I don't know if that was ever discussed with the city council. Uh, city staff has said that we took this offer off the table. That's clearly not true. We have never said it's off the table. It's always been on the table. We're open to this proposal. So by the back house, the alternative, this, this faces the pots house so if we remove the back guest house there are no second there's no staircase there's no second floor windows that eliminates a huge amount of privacy concerns by the pots no one can be on the second floor and looking down in their yard or their house the house is many feet away it's very far distance but there's no privacy issues from this proposed removal of the guest house also Staff says it's not a significant change in mass. It's a 34% reduction in the second floor, a 34% reduction. I consider that's a, that's a significant, it's not 5%, it's not 10%, it's, 30, it's a third smaller. That is a significant change in mass. 
Uh, the next page, it's, this is hard to see. I'll go quickly through this. By allowing the FAR to be expanded somewhat, so we're removing for, proposing 400 feet removal of the back house. Staff suggested it's a like for like. It's not. Allowing the FAR in the front to be 16 feet for the calculation for the driveway versus 20, it allows for about 115 square feet for the front house which would allow for a third bedroom on the main house instead of a two bedroom house, it would be a three bedroom house. So that, that's not like for like, it's clearly different. It's 25% of what we're taking off in the back. So we're appealing the planning commission decision because they acted arbitrary and capricious. They made their decision based on inappropriate and factual errors presented by staff, which he admits there were staff errors. They relied on those to make their decision. And, our, and again, our project meets every rule and code that the city has. So here's a couple of notable quotes. So Tracy Sweeney, the planet new, newest planning commissioner, she said about two weeks before our hearing, what this rule really boils down to is whether the commissioners are going to approve two-story houses or not. If there's a war on two-story houses in St. Elena. That's not in the code. That's being done by fiat through the planning commission. So regardless of the merits, is it two stories? No, we're not doing it. It's not fair. Next one is Council Member Kroll on a recent, uh, this is a couple years ago on Stockton Street. They had the same kind of issue. She felt, and this was from the minutes, she felt that the Planning Commission decision was subjective and mystified her because they're using some erroneous way to define character or the size of the house is the character. It's not the character. And I'm mystified as well on our property. And the last quote here is from one of you. Maybe you shouldn't make as much profit on the flag lot home. I would argue that profit and loss is not a required finding whether you approve or disapprove a project. So we're saying, we're, our argument is that the project as submitted, that's going down, okay, is consistent with neighborhood at scale and character. There are no pri significant privacy loss. It's significant, it's not a privacy loss, it's significant. Using their definition of character is arbitrary and capricious. The definition of understanding their scale is wrong. They don't, I don't, I'm not sure if they understand what scale means. We'll get that in a sec. So their definition of character is purely floor area ratio. It's an equation. When you're walking down Allen Street and you're looking at the houses, it's not the beautiful landscaping. It's not the architecture. It's not the feel, the neighborhood. It's an equation. It's how big is the house? How big is the lot? What's that percentage? That's the staff's definition of character. That's what the Planning Commission's definition of character is. The next item is that uh, the FAR is the current standard of how big you can. It's a limit. It's not a guideline. Can you go over that FAR number? No, you can't. It's a limit. It's not a guideline. If it's a guideline, you could go over, you could go under. You could, it's a limit. It's what you're allowed to do. It's not a standard. It's not a definition of character. That changes the rules, and it's capricious. It hasn't been approved by the city. It's both arbitrary and cap capricious. And the FAR chart used by the by the um, by the staff was errors. He mentioned this. Uh, they did in a FAR analysis, how big are we compared to other in the neighborhood? They're 85% wrong. All the pink ones on this schedule were incorrect, all detrimental to us. So what is character? What I think a reasonable person would define character. It's architectural design, it's landscaping, uniform land use, it's single family homes versus multifamily apartments. It's honoring the history of the area. So what is the character on the west side of Main Street? That, that, has, to be, that has to be defined. It's eclectic. There's detached single family residence. There, there's one and two story homes all over the place. It's heavily agricultural influence on the architecture. And most of the flag lots have two story homes. So real quick, here's some architecture right in the immediate neighborhood of our project. <coughs> Contemporary barn, this is right across the street. Right next to that is like a 600 square foot uh, bungalow. Next to our property is the Potts property. It's kind of a mid-century bungalow. There's a colonial right around the corner. It's about 4,000 feet. The next one, some of the more uh, common ones are farmhouses. Here's one right down the street. This is on Pine Street, just a few houses away. This one also is on Allen or a few houses away. Sorry, I'm going fast because I only have three minutes left. Uh, the next one is, uh, is another one. This is another uh, typical architecture. Some of the flag lots, most of the flag lots have two-story houses, 1527 Allen. You can see this from our project. There's a two-story house, large here. It's 3,400 square feet. This one is the old mayor's house. This one's on Madrona, right around the corner. Two-story house. 
this is the fish residence, I believe. This is 1711 retainer. That's a much different scale. That's that almost is three story house. That's on a flag lot. This one's on Spring Street. Another one. Notice there's windows on every side of this one. There's another one. The, the, every, almost every single one. Uh, here's what the the planning commission has reproved uh, lately. All these fars are pretty much at the max. All the ones with the red marks are two story houses. Why are they denying ours? We're the same as everyone else. They did a one story and two story analysis filled with holes. Let's go to the next one. We did our own. Oh, we're the white property in the middle. The pink, they're two story homes. The green is one story. About 60% of the homes in the immediate area surrounding our property are two story homes. They're not, staff use an arbitrary area to, d to be able to make their argument that there's less than, that there's more one story homes. So quickly on scale, left house, that's me on the photos, different scale, same house, different scale. House on the left, 10, 10 foot, 10 foot uh, front door, larger scale. House on the right, standard. That's what you see on the west side. Six, eight doors, uh, 10 foot or eight foot ceilings. That is scale. It's not the size. It's a proportion of those, those, uh, those items to the house. So here's it. So they're saying we're not consistent on the scale. This is right down the street, about five houses away. That's our first exact same scale exactly the same scale exactly the same scale as virtually every other house in San Elena the next one this is the back house this is across the street Brad and David's house the back house very similar similar scale almost similar architecture a little different but uh, but very similar in scale we're no different than any other house in San Elena on scale so quickly I have a minute here there's no way I'm gonna get this finished um, the privacy uh, it's threshold is significant. Uh, go to the next one, please. The steps we've taken, we eliminated and moved windows. This is on both, on the denied plan and the redesign plan. Uh, we, we raised second floor window single heights. We eliminated and moved windows in some cases. Uh, we added the mature olive trees. Get staff in, in opposition says that's not going to cut it. Well, I can tell you that someone living in these houses aren't going to cut their trees down to look at their neighbor's houses. That, that's not that's not what the, the view is. The view is looking up, maybe in the hills. It's not looking down in someone's yard. So the argument that someone's going to cut a tree down to look at their na the neighbor's house is ridiculous. They also said that there's not a significant distance between the houses. There are significant, huge differences between the houses. Tip, some of the ones that are older homes here, there's 10 feet, 20 feet. Well, our houses are 40 feet, 60 feet, 95 feet, 82 feet, 95 feet, 100 feet, 67 feet. Those are major difference. Those are almost lots away. I have four seconds here. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'd like to skip to the uh, took the time. Well, hey, I'm, I'm, you're not in. That's it. Thank you, David. <laughs> so, is there any other additional? Uh, Hi, Tracy Sweeney, 1407 Kearney Street, and I hadn't intended to talk tonight, but I did see I was quoted up there, and I would like to point out I was misquoted up there. As pl in the planning commission meeting, I think that the applicant is referring to, we were discussing the Allen Street property, and the quote that I made, and I would invite all of you to go back and review the tapes, basically said, and we were deciding to make the applicant go back and bring back new plans. And I was trying to point out the fact that we as commissioners need to be talking about that house where we really need to approve a two-story house before we put this applicant through the process of going back and revising plans. It had nothing to do with a broad statement on two-story homes or one-story homes in St. Helena, nor do I believe any of the commissioners took it that way. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claire Pott. Um, I live at the house next door, uh, 1849 Pine Street, with my uh, husband and two kids. Um, I've spoke before at the Planning Commission, and I feel like, you know, three minutes isn't very long, but, uh, and I feel like I was adequately heard there. Um, but I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, 
I heard the word massing, not massive, when Victor was discussing the, the, the scale of the homes, which I think is a completely different thing, and which I think is relevant and is real, because what he's trying to say, what I understand and what I feel also, is that uh, it's not the scale of either of the houses necessarily that's objected to, but the fact that they're both right there next to each other on what will actually then be quite two quite ordinary, in fact, smaller on uh, in scale lots than, than t is typical for our neighborhood. As the map that uh, David showed you illustrated, all the street, all the houses on our side of the street are one story uh, large, uh, small-ish homes on large lots. And um, in fact, across the street, it seems to me, at least in one case, or two, where there are flag lots, um, it's a second story house in the back, but still only a single story house in the front. I don't think in the neighborhood there's all that many examples of two two-story homes packed in in such great uh, concentration. Um, but there were a couple of other things. But actually what I'd really like to get, I'm putting my hat, my other hat on for a second, because um, yes, of course, I'm an interested party because I live right next door. But it also seems to me that something that hasn't been addressed at all in this um, proposal, but that gives me great concern is the use of water and the economics that they've, they've conju conjured to justify the use of an, the building of an entirely new home and pool uh, on the back where there currently is just nothing but a couple of dried out fruit trees. Um, I know they propose to replace the toilet at Via Corona with a low flow toilet. Well, I went into Via Corona and took a photograph of the toilet. <laughs> it's 1.6 gallons, which is, according to Wikipedia, that is a low flow toilet. I think when I reread um, their, uh, their proposal, they're proposing to use a I think a 1.28, I think that might be the new standard. And it's true, there are a lot of toilets that flush at lower capacity than 1.6 gallons these days. But the Wikipedia article that I read also indicated that there are problems, particularly where they are used in hotels and restaurants, because um, the amount of solid waste isn't propelled enough, and people do get a problem with buildup. So I just want to put that out there as a concerned citizen of St. Helena. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Michael Bothwell, 1431 Allen Avenue. I actually am on the other side of the property that's proposed. Um, I do want to bring up one point. Uh, it was brought up that there's no significant um, change to privacy. And I think what was brought up tonight, even in the alternative plan, uh, maybe were changes to visual privacy. But what I would remind the council of tonight is privacy is not only defined by vision, but privacy is also defined by auditory. So any intimate moments I may be having with my children, wife, occurrences in my backyard in 1431 now are going to be very much compromised by a second flag lot unit that's still two stories right behind my house. So uh, just a consideration to remember it was proposed, even this was brought up at the Planning Commission, and uh, just would like you City Council members to be aware of that as well. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Randy Chase, and I'm here with my wife Bernadette to voice our opposition to the pro uh, proposed development. We own the three adjoining parcels to the east of the proposed property and two others at Hudson and Pine, which are all within the 300 feet. <coughs> the building of two-story homes in our backyards will intrude on our privacy and that of our tenants. Um, they were mitigating the other side, the pot side of showing privacy. We have three properties on the other side. They're not mitigating our privacy. Uh, it will block our uh, mountain views that we've had for four generations. Uh, that is not a concern to them because their houses will now have mountain views. Um, with two-story houses overlooking our properties, it will adversely affect our enjoyment of our own properties. Um, and in order, to in order to approve a flag lot, according to the regulations, it must not adversely affect its neighbors, privacy, and views 
which this proposal will do. The parcel also does not meet the minimum width requirements for the back lot. The applicant has stated at previous meetings that the landscaping and trees will protect our privacy, but the landscaping and trees are on our property, not theirs. Uh, and if they plant trees, what's to stop a buyer from removing them later? Uh, building two maximum square footage homes does not fit into the neighborhood of smaller homes on large lots. As you see, as you see tonight and at previous planning meetings, surrounding residents are opposed to this project and have adamantly voiced their opinion. This project is ill-conceived and nothing but an attempt to maximize one group's profit at the expense of the city and its neighbors. The only motivating factor is profit no thoughts or concerns or attempts to fit in or be a member of the community and to preserve uh, the St. Helena we all love so much. The additional traffic and parking required will change the character, look, and appeal of our neighborhood. In addition, the higher density will create more noise pollution, infringing on our peace and tranquility, one of the reasons people want to live in St. Helena. The water issues concern us all in St. Helena, they're trying to convince you that two large homes with, with pools will use less water than the existing home. Uh, this type of math is ludicrous because all they're, do all they're doing is donating two low flow, flow toilets. I may not be a water expert, but simple logic tells me they all think we're stupid uh, if we can believe this. Oh, I guess I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Linda Burton and I reside at 1501 Allen Avenue, which is sort of kitty corner from the subject property. Uh, I was born and raised in St. Helena and inherited the little house that I now live in. Live in. in fact, my father built it. Um, Bernadette and I basically grew up together and you can imagine we've seen a lot of changes in the town and in our neighborhood specifically. I have never spoken out in opposition to any project in our neighborhood, but I felt compelled to do so uh, at this project because of the impact it's going to have on the neighborhood. As I believe Claire pointed out, one of the reasons we're so opposed is because they've, they're basically take, taking one modest uh, one single family home and creating two large, two, two large homes on, um, on this proposed lot. Um, in addition to the privacy concerns, the water concerns, uh, these folks really don't seem to be taking into account the modest homes that currently exist in this neighborhood. They certainly didn't show pictures of the homes that aren't two-story homes and uh, have extensive modern landscaping in the neighborhood. They selected out those homes that supported um, the alleged point they were making. And, you know, they seem to have worked themselves up into this, this feeling that they're being picked upon and treated arbitrarily. Um, and I just don't see that happening. Just because the code, these FAR regulations, allow a certain maximum doesn't mean that the house should be built to that maximum. That's when the character of the neighborhood comes in. And as the attorney that was advising the Planning Commission um, correctly pointed out, I thought that neighborhood character is not subjective. That if you, it, they, what, is, what they do is take a look at the surrounding houses, look at the setbacks, look at the measurements and look at the footprint, and that's how they determine neighborhood character. The reason I've never opposed any other project is because those folks that have come in and built in our neighborhood have, while they've tremendously upgraded the, the properties that they've undertaken, they have kept the neighborhood character 
uh, the homes are set back from the street. They remain single family homes, um, at least on the front of the street. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Brad Nickinson at 1842 Pine Street. Uh, we're directly across from the proposed project. And uh, to be honest, I'm here in support of our neighbors. The project would actually be an improvement for us to look at across the street compared uh, to what we look at now. Um, and so really here, because when this has come up before, and this is the third time that we've been at a meeting, two at planning, count, uh, planning committee and first time here, uh, it seemed to me that it's been very clear that the Planning Commission has been looking at the Municipal Code for creation of a flag lot. I understand now it's not a flag lot, but when the Planning Commission was looking at this, it was a flag lot being proposed, and there were three criteria, and at least, uh, in my mind, two of those criteria, most importantly privacy, was severely impacted by every neighbor surrounding that property. So I don't think there's any issue about fairness or arbitrariness here. The Planning Commission was simply following the Municipal Code. And uh, I think my feeling in looking at this is either the applicant needs to start talking to his neighbors, which he has not done, uh, and was recommended that he do at the last Planning Commission meeting, uh, or he goes and changes the Municipal Code. Um, it, it, it's just very sad that I think we're here again uh, in this situation, and that someone wants what they want, and they're not really <coughs> taking into consideration uh, anything else or really listening to anything else from anybody else and they're just kind of going full speed ahead. Um, and, and again, it's just, it, it's very sad. They could really do some wonderful things on that property. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hello, David Devon, uh, 1842 Pine Street. A couple clarifications. They highlighted our lot as pink as a two-story house, but we have a 2,900 uh, new single-story house in the back, and there's a disconnected uh, rental unit, a second unit in the front. We chose that because we didn't want any of those windows looking into our neighbor's backyards and windows. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I agree with everything that Claire was saying and everybody else before. This is now our third time. Um, and I like that you pointed out mass and massive. We're trying to take beautiful lot create smaller lots with bigger homes. So that's where I think we talked about mass and, and uh, compounding everybody's views. Um, our lot is just under 12,000, over 11,000 square feet. It's very long and it has lots of gardens, but you know, I hope I didn't move to a town that is allowing everybody to build to the setbacks because you're allowed to. Um, one of the staff members recommended to the commissioner made a point of saying, just because these guidelines are here, we, you, you have to take it into account because then there would be no point of having a planning commission. There'd be no plan of having you. So you do have to look at those properties individually. I was the only one that stood up at the beginning and said, I'm not against a, a, a flag lot. I'm not against two, two homes on that property. I would have loved to have done that but not two two-story houses with attached units or whether one's been taken away and they're putting it up in the front because even though they're 2,400 square foot homes, there's still a three or 400 square foot attached unit, so the, the bulk is still there. Um, those are my thoughts. I hope you all do the right thing. It's a great street to live on. Unfortunately, we're all dealing with a lot of stress and tension with the, this project. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so is there any other public comment? Then I'll invite the uh, applicant to do a five minute rebuttal. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the council. I'm Dave Trotter. Um, I'm uh, the attorney for the appellants and applicants, uh, Mark Kay. Like you, I'm also an elected council member in the town of Moraga, so I have some appreciation for what you do as a public service. I appreciate having this opportunity to address the, the council this evening. I just have a few points. <coughs> I want to speak to the timeliness of the appeal uh, because we believe that the appeal is timely and that the city is legally stopped from contending otherwise. Um, and if you look at the record here, the February 3rd, 2015 Planning Commission agenda contained a statement 
that a person dissatisfied with a decision of the Planning Commission may appeal that decision pursuant to section 17.08.180 and then goes on absent an appeal by the City Council or by a citizen, the appeal period will terminate two weeks after the Planning Commission hearing. In other words, 14 days. That's what the section provides for. And that's what the Planning Commission and the staff said at the conclusion of the February 3rd, 2015 hearing before the Planning Commission. They made the standard announcement that there's a 14 day appeal period. We relied on that. We actually filed our appeal um, on the 13th day. Uh, and we were entitled to do that to rely on the statements by the city. So the city, I believe, is a stopped legally from contradicting its 14 day appeal statements now. And the city suffers no prejudice from considering this appeal fully on its merits. Um, and why is that? Um, because any delay here in getting this appeal heard is actually the fault of the city. This matter was supposed to have been heard at your March 24, 2015 hearing. That's what we were told by the city attorney's office. I was advised by the assistant city attorney in the first part of March that the staff had failed somehow to send out the required public hearing notices in a timely manner. So this appeal has slipped to April 14th, but that's not our fault. And the fact is that the, the, fa the timing of our appeal has no bearing at all on the ability of the, si the city to process the appeal and for this, the, the city to basically ultimately make a decision on the full merits. Second point is that um, contrary to the staff report, the redesign of the homes at 1837 Pine Street does remain on the table as an alternative package proposal for approval of this project by the council. And we have a memo that came in this evening, um, some points. Um, the fact of the matter is that it minimizes the reducing in massing. And uh, this is a massing question. Um, there's been a substantial reduction in the massing on the rear lot. Um, and it has resulted in significantly reduced privacy impacts. And note that the word in the code is significant, not all privacy impacts. But if, you've, if there is no significant loss of privacy or impact on privacy, then the finding has to be made. Uh, the fact that certain neighbors are, are concerned about auditory privacy or things like that, that's not a significant concern. The fact is that if you have somebody living next to you in a neighborhood like the west of Main Street area, you may have some people being able to hear what's happening in your yard. But that is not a privacy impact that is significant. And we've done a lot since the February 3rd hearing uh, to reduce the privacy impacts. Um, and so I think that needs to be taken into account. That alternative proposal is in play. We would ask you to give it the fair consideration that it deserves. And with regard to um, the width of the easement, uh, we, we basically are asking for consistent treatment with the 1701 Madrona Avenue project. But we're talking about a 20 foot wide area. We're talking about bridging and coming up with a creative solution, something that this city I know prides itself on, it's in your mission statement right there at the back of the room, that bridges that difference so that you have a 16 foot wide drive, fully accessible, um, but you give us the FAR credit so we can have a three bedroom house, not a McMansion, a very, very small modest home on the front side. Um, that seems to us to be a win-win for everybody concerned. And you know, in fact, it'll be better than what happened at 1701A Madrona because there we're going to have the, the, you know, instead of being a very narrow, unlandscaped area, you have the full landscape treatment that you'd be entitled to. So on the ground, you'll have everything that you have under the code, but you're giving this, this application a small benefit, which is in keeping with the character of the neighborhood, which is for beautiful homes, a farmhouse design and a barn house design. One last point, because I'm out of time, um, is the water issue, which has been talked about tonight. You have a report from, can I finish my sentence? Um, can we have the stop button turn off? Thank you. Um, you have a report from your staff and a report provided by the applicant that makes it very clear that the, the there's been compliance in full with the requirements of the city with respect to water mitigation. That's not a basis for denying this project. So we would ask that you approve, grant this appeal, approve this project as redesigned, and I'm here to, ha I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you.
I want to clarify one point first. Someone, one of the comments mentioned that um, privacy and flag law creation included preserving views of existing homes. Is that, I don't see that in, in the quote of 17.112.100, section I, but is that in our code or not? It, I, I don't believe the code, and if you have it in front of you, d I'd go with that as opposed to my memory. I, I don't believe it discusses protecting views. It definitely discusses um, privacy impacts, as indicated. Uh, the, the word is significant <coughs> privacy impacts, and there's other language in there um, related to impacts on neighboring um, homes. I don't recall the exact verbiage. Can you also comment, I didn't hear it, covered, maybe I missed it, but on the parking situation with the second units? Right. The code for a second unit requires an additional parking space, and from an operational point of view, that space cannot be just simply in the driveway in back of someone's garage. Um, the uh, plans as proposed show a space that kind of diagonally or angles uh, onto Pine Street, um, and so that arrangement is is not workable, um, and it's. I, I think there, <coughs> there may be a design solution there. Um, I, I don't think that's that's one of the unsolvable uh, or an unsolvable aspect of the project. I think um, that it may be possible to uh, to get a workable uh, parking solution um, on on the front lot, but the way it is right now, it's not workable. Can I just, or you have other questions? No. There's a, there's a quote in here, and I recognize at least some of the, the quote, but it has been misquoted. And it's, it's uh, Mr. Wright has said here a notable quote, quote, maybe you shouldn't make as much profit on the flag lot home. That, those are words uh, taken from me, but misquoted. I, I uh, about a month and a half ago, met with Mr. Wright on the property to get a lay of the land, to, to view the land. And the quote is this. There are some people in the community who say that you shouldn't be able to make a profit on that second home. I never, and then we talked a little bit more, and it, I made it very clear that I do not subscribe to that notion at all. Uh, in fact, it was actually stated here today, and I think it was stated at the Planning Commission. So I'm very disheartened, to say the least, that that quote was put into this argument to say, to, to, to really say the opposite of what I intended and what I meant. I would have never said something like that. It was in the context of a conversation where Mr. Wright was describing the project, the benefits of the project, and I asked him, well, what are the objections? And in the course of that discussion, I said, and there are some people who say you shouldn't make a profit either. And I made it very clear that I do not subscribe to that at all, didn't at the time. And I, 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 want, uh, I want Mr. Wright to know that, and I hope his counsel will, will let him know my feelings on that. It's not going to, I'm an attorney, I've been doing land use for 27 years. Uh, everybody who comes in front of me is going to get a fair hearing. It's not going to be based on profit motive. I have clients who make profit. If they all thought I was against people making profit, I wouldn't be in business. So I just wanted to be very clear on that. Um, I'm, st you know, the legal process is daunting and very restrictive, and it's cumbersome, and, and it doesn't allow us to move forward sometimes in the, in the way that we need to. The proposal, the, this alternative proposal is intriguing. For, you know, I, I'm interested in it. I don't think that the city, in my view, legally can do this trade with the FAR. So I, I'm, you know, I, I see that the applicants are making great strides to move forward in the right direction. I'm still not comfortable with that part of it, the, the trade with, with the FAR and having that, that, that property uh, uh, be counted on the front property. So I, I'm having a little difficult time on that one. Frankly, I haven't had a whole lot of time to evaluate this modified uh, proposal. And I would, I would recommend, you know, if, this, if wherever this goes, that, that the applicants can always go back because it's the recommendation here, if we do, do it in, according to the recommendation, is without prejudice. Um, a lot of work has been done on this project. My basic concern is, is not so much the neighborhood and the character, but the two houses right next to uh, the project. In particular, the, 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 the modest homes that are right next 
next to door to this project on both sides. So, you know, when those folks moved in there, they never expected to have two story homes, two two story homes right next to their, their very modest homes, one story homes. Um, and that's troubling to, to know that you're gonna have, even without the windows, there's still a massive effect. And in my view, there's still a loss of privacy. I'm having a real difficult time, you know, seeing that house and having myself being in the pot's backyard or in the pot's house or the other neighbors on the other side and not feeling offended in terms of massing and privacy. So every, the other issues, some of the legal issues, yeah, I mean, you've got their problems with the, the, the rear width. There's problems with the parking. I, in my view, there's problems with the width of the, of the easement, the, the, uh, the 20 foot easement. I think that is a problem legally. Uh, I think there's a problem with the timeline in terms of appealing the denial of the parcel. Uh, all those things can be worked out if we have a project that can be reviewed again by the planning commission. That's kind of where I'm leaning and I'm just talking out loud. I don't know where this is gonna go. I'm, I'm not willing or ready to, to say the, the, the planning commission got it wrong. I think the planning commission studied this in great detail and unless the planning commission really does something egregiously, arbitrarily, uh, you know, capriciously, I show great deference to, the, to our planning commission. Our planning commission worked hard on this project and I'm not seeing that they made the wrong call here. But there's, you know, this is a, this is a project that will continue to get worked on, I hope, to the benefit of the city. So uh, those are my comments. I'm just willing to, I'm, I'm trying to get a dialogue going. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, well, I just wanted to add, um, I, I was, you quoted somebody who quoted me and I, I don't know where this is coming from because I don't think it's meeting minutes, but um, it is also completely out of context. It was, it, it had to do strictly with the placement of a garage on a property. It had nothing to do with anything that was um, related to things that are at issue in this case. Um, I, this is the way I feel about this project. Um, with respect to the um, appellate appellate issues, um, there were two time frames that applied in this case, and um, it, I agree with the staff that it was the applicant's responsibility to determine the period applicable. Um, ignorance of the law is not um, a defense. So um, I think that the city has every right to um, assert that um, argument. I also think that the um, it's irrelevant to me what has gone on in the past. We have to follow the municipal code. So that 20 foot um, driveway is not a negotiable situation. And I don't care when it was followed or not followed or anything, all of that is completely irrelevant. We are following our code now and that is the guideline. And in that sense, um, I do think the planning committee, the planning commission um, got it right when they found that um, the three specific findings were not um, to establish, to create the flag lot, were not um, supported by this project. And I think that the Planning Commission got it right. I agree with Paul that um, in order to overturn the Planning Commission's decision, it has to be something pretty, um, pretty strong. I do not believe the Planning Commission ap acted arbitrarily or capriciously. I think they acted with a lot of thought. And um, I would be in, I am in favor of denying this appeal without prejudice um, to the applicants bringing it back. I also, um, I received this, this um, revised plan at five o'clock today, which did not allow me adequate time to evaluate it. I want to point out that it, it's not really just the, the, the two neighbors to the left and the right. You've got six lots surrounding this that I think all get impacted by two story condition, two, two story conditions. I just want to add, I agree with everything that's been said. I want to add a few things. With respect to flag lot creation, which is probably the, the gating issue, if you can't um, <coughs> accept the findings to create a flag lot, then everything else is somewhat moot. That said, I can't say that this flag lot will not 
result in significant loss of privacy. You're going from one unit to four units. You're going from one family to four families. It could have who knows how many people. It could have who knows how many cars. I can't say that there won't be excessive noise by going from one to four. I can't say that there won't be you know, tr parking congestion when you're who knows how many cars each of those four homes might have at some point when their kids are teenagers. So I, I can't get beyond the flag law situation. So the rest to me, while there are deficiencies and violations of, of, of our code and our law, um, I think that needs to be worked out. And so if there is a redesign, frankly, you know, I'm not wearing a planning commission hat anymore. I think the purview for that is the planning commission. So I'd love to see the neighbors and the applicant, you know, I have a link here, uh, work this out, come back with an alternative design, but go talk to the planning commission first and see if it can be worked out in that venue. No uh, project that will be listed as being permitted under the code of ethics and ordinance that would be required to have a redesign or a change in the design in order to get that uh, change in place. And I don't think the language that that said needed to change in the applicant agreement that they have uh, that they think is um, that they are entitled to have that change. Okay, so I I'll move to deny the appeal without prejudice. I'll second that. Just for clarification, that would be um, with the council adopting the findings presented to you in the resolution uh, in the, the staff packet this evening. Exactly. Okay. Okay. With the council adopting the findings presented to us in the staff packet. It might also be appropriate if, if this is your uh, determination and you're feeling um, to consider adding to those findings something saying that you did consider the proposed revisions uh, presented by the applicant and you, um, you either did or didn't find them uh, persuasive. I'm hearing from the council that you didn't find those persuasive um, for uh, overturning or reaching a different uh, conclusion. So I'll restate. Um, I move to <coughs> overturn the appeal or not support the appeal uh, based on the findings presented in the staff report tonight and add that we, we did look at and discuss the proposed revisions uh, and did not find that those would uh, change our, our uh, decision in that. I had already seconded it, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't care. Councilor Pitts? Yes. Doreen? Yes. Kroll? Yes. Vice Mayor White? Yes. So that ends item 20 and <coughs> this is eight. And so we uh, adjourn the meeting and our next meeting, <coughs> our next regular city council meeting is scheduled for April 28th at 6 p.m. here at Denny's Hall. Thank you. Thank you.